Good afternoon to everyone uh, here at the CMA's headquarters in Canary Wharf, London, and to those joining us uh, online. Um, welcome to, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the uh, CMA Data Technology and Analytics Conference 2022. Um, this is the first event because the CMA has decided we will be hosting this every two years. So it's a great, uh, great pleasure to have you here at our inaugural event. Um, my name's Stefan Hunt. I'm the Chief Data and Technology Insight Officer at the CMA. That means I've built and I lead our data and technology teams. So this is the, this is the first event. Um, and what we're trying to do is make sure, obviously we're trying to focus on data and technology, but what we're also trying to do is make sure that we're bringing in new speakers uh, who the competition and consumer protection community does not ordinarily, ordinarily hear from to try and kind of enrich the understanding and the conversations that we have. Um, uh, I'd like to spe uh, specifically welcome those online. We know we've got some people uh, who are joining us from the east coast of the US right through to Australia, so welcome to you all. So there's two things that we're uh, you know, trying to do over the next day and a half. The first is really trying to focus on understanding new and evolving challenges in the technology industry and digital markets. And the second thing that we're trying to focus on is what agencies themselves need to do to develop technical capabilities and expertise. Uh, on the second of these topics, we published a paper yesterday that I wrote uh, on the technology-led transformation of competition and consumer agencies. And what we're going to be doing over the next day and a half, we're going to, uh, just after this uh, short welcome, uh, we're going to be joined by Bill Kovacic. And Bill is going to, I'll introduce Bill in a second. Bill is going to do uh, a, a keynote, and that's going to lead into a, uh, a panel from uh, our esteemed heads of agencies. So we're very lucky to be joined by Olivier uh, Gesson, uh, Benoit Couré, and uh, obviously Andrea Cashelli um, from the CMA, uh, all in the room. And we're also going to be joined virtually by uh, Lena Khan and Gina Cass Gottlieb as well. And so they're going to give an uh, overview for what we're going to be doing over the next day and a half. Then there's two sides uh, to the conference. So the first side is looking at the new and evolving challenges. Uh, and we've got a keynote from Tim Wu uh, after the heads of agencies panels. And that's going to be focused, there's going to be a panel focusing on privacy and the future of the internet. Then tomorrow afternoon, we've got a keynote from Benedict Evans, where he's going to be thinking about what are the trends and technologies that agencies need to understand for the future. That's going to be followed by a panel on the same topic, and then we're going to have uh, the final panel focusing on interoperability. Now, there's the second side of the conference as well, which is really trying to focus on agencies. Uh, we're going to kick that off later today through, uh, I'm going to give a presentation on the paper that I just mentioned, and then I'm going to be joined by, I'm very happy to say, by um, colleagues from six different agencies who are chief data officers or equivalents, and we're going to have a broad conversation about what agencies are doing globally. Tomorrow morning, we have a series of four presentations from four different agencies going into more depth on specific things that agencies have been doing in this space. And then at the end of the conference, we got a keynote from Susan Athey, and then we have a, a variety of individuals outside of the, mostly outside of the competition community, are going to help us think about where does the, where can and should the agencies be going in the future. So. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce Bill Kovacic. Um, Bill is uh, a law professor at George Washington University uh, in the US. Uh, he's also had many positions at the Federal Trade Commission. In particular, he was chair of the Federal Trade Commission from 2008 and 2009. He was also a non-executive director at the CMA for many years, finishing his tenure just recently. Um, the vast majority of you will be aware of Bill already, so with my, it's my great pleasure to welcome Bill to the stage. And I'm sure he's just coming. <laughs> Sound okay? That's great. Thank you. Uh, I'm assuming there's a mic problem. That's what I think it is. <laughs> Brilliant. I was uh, negotiating the fee. <laughs> That's... <laughs> <laughs> There's a skill to doing the holdup in just the right way. <laughs> it's 
pre-contractual opportunism, post-contractual reneging, uh, all in the same, same process. Uh, Stefan, I'm uh, delighted to be here today. I'm so thrilled to be back in an agency I admire so much and has played such a leadership role in, in, the, in the new incarnation and, and in events like today. So thank you, and thank you to the whole team for the chance to be here. I wanna talk about two perennial issues that confront competition authorities. One of them is how much to invest in building capability and what kind of capability is worth investing in. The question of investment versus consumption and the form of current matters is a difficult one because of the urgency that agencies face every day of the week to produce more cases, to have a higher rate of output, and when you start talking about investment that has a longer term effect and may not provide immediate results, you receive a quizzical look that says, do you really understand how we get rated, how we're evaluated? And it squeezes out an understanding of where good programs come from and the role that investment plays in enabling you to do good programs in the future. To get us started today, I want to give some reasons for making that investment. To have as part of the routine effort of agency decision making, an investment in what might be called capital goods, capital features that enable agencies to do a good job in the future. And the focal point of my comments is on what might be called big antitrust and consumer protection data. We are so accustomed to hearing about private enterprises and the great benefit they derive from collecting data and looking at data sets. How it's the new oil, the new input, the new oxygen, the elemental characteristic that enables them to compete. I'd suggest to you that agencies have big data too. And the older you are as an agency, the more data you've collected. And it's the ability to use your own information effectively and reflect upon your own experience to collect a bit more data from the outside and to finish today to work with colleagues in other institutions that puts you in a position to do a better job. I'm gonna use some examples. Uh, some of these are happy, some of these are sad. Uh, they mostly come from my own experience. Uh, not in this agency, this is a great agency, but in other agencies where the experience has been somewhat more mixed where the effort to make good policy has not always exploited the possibilities that are built into a base of experience that's enormously informative. And a basic intuition of the whole talk is that when you look at the literature about ed management, about private firms, about public administration, how do they improve? They learn. They learn over time by reflecting on what they've done before. They learn about things that have worked and they grow from studying carefully things that have not. So why care about the investment in building better analytical capability? Much in the way that the CMA has done in building the data team that stuff on heads. First, if you have good analytics, you can do a better diagnosis of observed behavior. You can understand better what you're looking at. And what might seem to be a collection of random dots, if you stare at it too closely, if you step back, no, that's a haystack. It's in the Museum d'Orsay. It's not just a bunch of dots on a canvas. And you get a better idea of what it means. Let me give you a sad example. It involves the global financial crisis, and I'm gonna tell you about the greatest professional regret of my lifetime and my experience at the FTC. We had not all of the mortgage lending responsibility. We had oversight for mortgage lenders who were not banks. So we saw part of what was going on in the mortgage lending business. And we ran a lot of cases involving fraud, misrepresentation to borrowers. And we brought dozens of cases dealing with this kind of conduct. But we noticed, at least in an idiosyncratic way, that lots of the people who were getting loans had no evident capacity to pay for them. We saw the famous ninja loans before other people did. No income, no job. I remember one loan form that I saw when I was in the general counsel's office that basically said, how much money would you like to earn next year? Not how much money are you making right now? And when we'd sit down with meetings with the other financial services regulators, we would say, 
there's a peculiar pattern going on that we're noticing in the course of doing fraud cases, and it seems as though many of the people who are doing the borrowing are never going to be able to pay these loans. Impossible. And this only works if housing prices keep going up and the lenders can flip the houses back over, take whatever equity is there and walk away with it. Now, the pros in the financial services business, like the Federal Reserve said, nice Federal Trade Commission, kid, why don't you go sit down back over the children? We're the pros. Now, you've got a few of these impressions that's interesting. But what we didn't have is a process for taking the whole database, extracting all of the instances in which we saw that there was no way on earth that people could pay for the loans, so that we had a data set that we could put in front of the banking officials and say, look at this. What happens if housing prices flatten out or, God forbid, dip? We will be on the edge of a calamity if that happens. We didn't have that database that systematically enabled us to put it right in front of them. Now, we might have been waved off anyway and told to sit with the children instead of the pros in the bank regulatory business. And I don't know how hard we would have pulled the emergency cord and said, this is breaking down and there is an abyss and we're going full speed ahead towards it but we would have been in a much better position going to the other regulators if we'd looked at our experience base, assembled the full volume of loans that we knew of where you had these fictitious hopes and wishes about income and said, this is a disaster in process. Can't tell you when it will happen, but it's going to happen. Better analytics, better data collection would have put us in a position to do a much better job. And yes, if we'd studied it, we would have thought immediately by 2003, 2004, 2005, this is a moment to do a market study. This is a moment to do a market study that looks at what's going on in this sector. How pervasive are these patterns? Could we have avoided the meltdown at the FTC? Could we at the FTC have avoided the meltdown? I don't know. Counterfactuals in life are treacherous, aren't they? You don't get to just pick out one event, hold everything else constant, and say how much better it would have been. It's not like that. But it gnaws at me on a regular basis. What would have happened if we'd had a better picture and a better set of information about what's going on so that our concerns would not have been brushed off as idiosyncratic, impressionistic observations about what was happening in the sector? Hard, systematic data would have made a big difference, I'd like to think. So, data puts you in a position to understand much better what you're looking at and to derive important policy prescriptions. Second thing it does, it enables you to cope with technological and commercial dynamism. Now, are we living in an era where the rate of change is unprecedented? No. Go back 100 or so years. Go back to the people living 1900 to 1920. What were they looking at? Telephone. Airplane, moving pictures, talking pictures, revolutions in steam and in rail transportation, steamships across the board. It was no less bewildering. I would assert that the absolute and relative rate of change today is greater. So we've seen this movie before, but where have competition authorities and consumer authorities been habitually struggling to catch up to understand what's going on to do an appropriate diagnosis and to formulate appropriate forms of intervention. And the complaint about the system is that especially in technologically sophisticated fields, the agencies don't know what they're looking at. This is a complaint that's made in the course of formulating policy, speaking to legislators and speaking to courts. That you're habitually looking at yesterday's problem and you become pretty good at diagnosing what was a problem five years ago, but not so good about interpreting what's going on now. How do you cope with the dynamism? Why is it important? Another painful story. Partly happy, partly sad. It's a measure that the FTC adopted to limit the use of unsolicited telephone calls to the home under a rule that became known as the do not call rule. For about 10 years, it worked well. But what was the blind spot? We didn't do rigorous stress testing with technologists to see how the industry would adapt. 
And what's the sobering story, whether you're talking about the DMA, the DMU, or something else where you have prescriptions, is how are firms going to adapt to them? You think they're going to surrender and say, I quit, that they won't adapt? One possibility is they'll adapt in a rapid and significant way. Have you anticipated the ad adaptation when you write a decree in a merger case or in a conduct case? What you can be sure of is they're not going to raise their hands and surrender and give up. That there will be a process of adaptation. And even if it's not a conscious process of evasion, the technology will push in directions that you can't even imagine, perhaps immediately. For the do not call rule, we did a good job of dealing with the existing technology. What was the blind spot? We did not have a team of technologists inside or consulting outside who took our rule and were basically told, how could this fall apart in five years or 10 years? It worked pretty well for a decade. But we didn't see what was going to happen with robocalling. We didn't have the technologists working on the project to say, here's what's coming at you later on. Here are the defenses you have to build in in order to deal with it. A rule that worked really well for 10 years. Lesson for the broader community is that if you don't have that expertise in the house, and yes, you can contract out for some of it, but if you don't have the organic capability inside to understand what external consultants are telling you, you're not necessarily a lot better off. But in any process that involves rapid technological change and commercial changes that go with it, you have to have a process and the capacity to ask, if we take this measure, what will be the corresponding adjustments that take place in the business community? And the further lesson was the importance of having an ongoing consultation. One thing I like about the privacy sandbox is that there is a mechanism built into the remedial scheme to ask on an ongoing basis, is it doing what we thought? Is it doing what we thought? And talking to outside parties and posing the same question to them. And it's not enough to do that every five or 10 years, to have the periodic conference that looks ahead at competition in the next century, technology in the next decade. We did those very well at the FTC. We had one in particular in the 1990s. It was a breakthrough public consultation. And we asked all the wise people on earth to come and talk to us. Uh, a tip about planning programs, if you like academics to come and speak with you, call them up and say, I know your time is very limited, but you are so smart. Would you please come and give us a minute? They'd say, I am very busy. I don't know if I can do it. How about tomorrow morning? They'll show up right away. Well, we brought all of these wise people, and they were on target with a number of things. But in my pocket, I have one thing that they missed completely. Storage. This is a thumb drive. Everybody was talking about floppy disks or hard disks, three inches by five. They didn't catch this. And least of all, did they catch what could be out there climatologically called a cloud. Nobody saw that coming. It wasn't enough to have that exercise now and then. That's got to be an ongoing process where you talk to people in the technology field on a regular basis and go to their conferences where sometimes they're talking about science fiction, but how fascinating it is to see that the science fiction becomes truth much faster than you think. And to do that well, you've got to have that capacity inside the house too. You have to have the people who can guide that process. It has to be a routine, ongoing process because I think we've learned in enforcement in this field, it's never over. It doesn't end. It's an iterative, continuing process. Another lesson is the benefit of detection. This is a happier story. My colleagues here from the Department of Justice know this history better than I do, but I'm struck at how the reflection on the early variants of the DOJ leniency program produced a major rethink about how leniency could work. The older version of leniency basically said, you tell us everything you know, and we'll do something good for you. Something, not everything. Something, some dispensation, some, not complete. But you tell us everything you know. Part of what DOJ saw in reflecting on the experience was that that wasn't eliciting a large volume of traffic in the door. And the rethink, drawing on some theory involving game theory, 
drawing upon actual experience, a new leader, Ann Bingaman, who was willing to do a bold new thing, said it's only going to work if you provide a much better prize for being first. And they did it. What's the great benefit? It revolutionized our field. You can make an argument that no single policy intervention, innovation by a public competition agency has done more to change our lives and improve our effectiveness than what Ann Bingaman did roughly 30 years ago in establishing the new leniency regime. In the world of antitrust statuary, she ought to be on a plinth because of what she did and made that happen. That was a shrewd reflection on past experience and the shrewd formulation of a new policy experiment whose success was hardly guaranteed at the time it started. And I think what we're seeing in lots of interesting research now about cartels is that if you look at your full experience with cartels and you study them carefully to see how they operate, how they're formed, if the only thing they do is meet in a restaurant to say, let's raise prices, they deserve to be punished if only because of their stupidity. That's only the starting point. That doesn't do the job. There's so many other things they have to do, and studying carefully what they do to make it work identifies behaviors that you want to look for. And indeed, to use artificial intelligence, other screening mechanisms as a supplement to other enforcement tools to detect misconduct. And what I think is quite interesting in looking at experience is much of what they do to make it work involves using exclusionary practices that are the favorites of dominant firms like exclusive dealing, to take one choice. It helps you build presumptions that you might build into the enforcement of Section 2 of the Sherman Act or other single firm conduct effects. What it does is it gives you the ability, a sense of what to look for. But if you look at that experience in a systematic way, it gives you a lot of clues about what's coming up, coming up next. A couple last thoughts about why this helps. If you approach courts with a better base of knowledge about what you've done, it improves your ability to gain deference. My judgment about courts is that they defer to you when they think you're right. The, the mechanical formula otherwise are meaningless. If they think you've persuaded them, then they defer, they recite the wonderful language. But they want to see your work first. And part of the work you want to show them is, we've got data, we've done the analytics. We are an expert institution. We're not just based the, basing our, our, our views on impressions. We have an element of science and empirical work. You can trust us. And that that's a basis for gaining, for gaining deference. So it helps in the litigation process. And the last main thing I'll mention is that it helps with remedies. Especially the older the agency is, the body of remedi remedial experience it has grows. How many people are familiar with that within their own agencies? Do they know what they've done? You know, one of the main complaints that's been made so often about competition and policy in the modern era is we, we missed innovation. We ignored it. We were only concerned about price. We slap ourselves on the forehead and said, my God, how could we have missed innovation? What a surprise. If that were true, that would be a searing indictment of competition policy. Well, it didn't happen. When I look at the experience, for example, with aerospace and defense, a body of about 60 transactions that the two US agencies looked, have looked at at a period going back to the 1970s, every single theory of liability was predicated on significantly or exclusively innovation-related effects. And a lot of the remedies had innovation-related solutions built in. Well, in thinking today about what we should do, what does that tell us? What did we learn about how to assess information, innovation-related effects? And what kinds of remedies put agencies in a better position to pick a good remedy in the future to decide when to intervene? There's so much there from past experience that provides a basis for understanding what to do next. But you can't do it if you don't have a good catalog of your previous cases, if you don't retain some knowledge about what you did, and yes, an internal data and analytics scheme can help you interpret those results and decide what to look at. I've talked in general about reasons to build this capability, a concluding thought about how to make sure the capability works well. I've been assuming that 
that capability building effort is taking place inside of a single agency. Imagine what you would do if you joined up the knowledge base accumulated across a lot of agencies over time. One of my co-authors is, is a real doctor and a lawyer. He is a doctor. And he tells me that in healthcare, a great source of the revolution in healthcare, improvements in healthcare, came from joining up data about treatment, diagnosis, surgical technique across a lot of hospitals. So that instead of looking at the experience of a single cardiology department, you were looking at hundreds. Hundreds that gave you more observations that you systematically examined. And that put any one cardiology team at one hospital in a much better position to do good medicine. So when we talk about the cliche, the slogan about how important cooperation is, and it is sure, yes, 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 yes. I'd like a, a, a dollar, a pound, or a euro for every time I've heard about it. It's really good. Suppose it were genuine in this sense that you were able to assemble and bring to bear all of that big antitrust data, all the experience, and pull it as a way of thinking about what to do next. I think that kind of analytics carried out across agencies would make them all better off and test experimentation. So how to do it? Well, you go to a bar association meeting, if you went to the American Bar Association meeting, you go to the IBA and you put the poor public officials up there, what's one of the first things they say? We've been very busy. We've been extremely busy. We've been busy. You want to stand up from the crowd, and I say this to myself when I used to give this talk, and scream back at myself, I don't care if you've been very busy, have you been very effective? What are you doing to improve your effectiveness over time? Uh, I had an athletic coach once who had a sign on the wall that said, never confuse activity with accomplishment. So we've been very busy. Well, have you been very effective? One element of building effectiveness is to know what's in your R&D budget to get smarter every year. How much is it? That's what we ought to be asking all the time. What's your R&D budget look like? Studies, building this kind of capability. And as a community, what we want is the willingness to make investments today that generate good results tomorrow. Don't tell us about picking low-hanging fruit. Tell us about how many trees you planted. That's what we'd like to know over time about R&D. And that's why I congratulate Stefan, Andrea, the board, the colleagues here at the CMA for making that aspiration a reality. Thank you. Colleagues for the first panel, please. <laughs> Plenty of good seats. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. We have the opportunity now to speak with a number of agencies that are doing this and actually putting this, putting this program into effect and carrying out a lot of good work that's designed to put them collectively in a position to deal not just with the overall range of matters coming their way, but with everything involving big, difficult, and challenging tech and everything that goes with it. Uh, I'll introduce East as we start along, but uh, with, us, with us on the stage here, Andrea Cascelli from the CMA. We've got, uh, we've got uh, uh, Olivier Guisson from DigiComp, Benet Couvre from The Authorité, and on the line we have with us Lena Khan from the FTC and, and Gina Cascott-Lieb from the Australian ACCC. Uh, a wonderful selection of officials who I think have reflected in what their agencies do the importance of making the investments that make you better off in the future. To kick off our discussion, we're going to have initial presentations by each of our colleagues. And to start us off, I'm going to ask our host, uh, Andrea, if you can get us underway, please. Great. Uh, thanks, Bill, for the introduction. And thanks, uh, Stefan, for putting together the conference, which uh, looks very interesting. Uh, so let me just make a few points and some reflections on our journey. And 
uh, Stefan uh, wrote this great paper, actually, that was published yesterday, which I would really recommend to people because, in a sense, there's a lot of detail about what we have done and the things that work and things that work less. So we started in uh, 2017 uh, with a clear sense, I think, from me and from the board and Bill and other board members have been very supportive that uh, we needed to uh, up our game. We were really missing uh, on a lot of the skills and knowledge that was uh, on the other side. And it some, somehow, uh, same way, sort of economist managed to find their way into agencies in the, certainly in Europe in the late 90s. Uh, there was cer certainly a need for technologies to do the same. And uh, some of the lessons from the kind of introduction of economics uh, from, a, from an agency point of view were quite, quite relevant there. So uh, we're lucky to uh, appoint Stefan as the, the first head, and in many ways that really helped us because obviously Stefan is, is an economist, both as a first degree in uh, sort of experimental psychology. When he was at our financial services regulator, was running sort of big experiments with big data. So it was already bringing in um, lots of new skills. And the idea was to be quite open at that point, because to be honest, we, we didn't know a huge amount. You know, we probably similarly to a number of the law firms represented here, we have a very granular understanding of the legal and economic expertise available. You know, we have lots of internal expertise. If we need particular legal or economic expertise in very particular fields, we have a very good sense of who are the people who are the experts in that ecosystem. And we had none of that. So one of the first things I discussed with Stefan was very much to try to go out there and really start building this ecosystem, you know, understanding you know, who are the academics who work in these particular areas, uh, what are the career paths for their students, um, what are the possible areas of overlap between the policy uh, side and, uh, and the technology side in this space. And then we didn't really think about the particular areas or subfields. So if you, if you read, uh, when you read Stefan's paper, where we have ended up over the last three, four years is, is having a group of data scientists who obviously mainly work on big data. So it's big data on cases and big data uh, internally. We have a group of data engineers who have been mainly involved in helping us with our own digital transformation in making sure that our own processes, the kind of the pipes for us uh, on case work and everything we do uh, are more effective. Later on, we added uh, this technology insight team, which is a bit more qualitative in nature. So it's not big data, but it's people who go to the conferences, read uh, stuff, and understand h how some of these key technologies are evolving. Because again, one of the key touch points for us, like for other agencies, is merger control. You know, We have a constant flow of complex mergers, sometimes in very new areas. and. I think all of us, and you know, I see Lena on screen, and I think she says she thinks that she's in the same place, that some of the mistakes we've all made over the last 10, 15 years are because we didn't quite understand some of the technologies, some of the issues in some of these mergers that they were allowed, uh, allowed. So I think there is a sense of, you know, how do we do horizon scanning? How do we, uh, how do we get more plugged in in some of these new technologies, and how can we be more effective there? Um, and then we added the behavioral scientists, which again, I think is the area where Stefan initially was doing a lot of work. And this is an area that is more and more relevant. If I look at our current portfolio, if I look at the remedies, if I look at our digital cases, just understanding remedies, understanding um, you know, online choice architecture, and, and a number of our consumer protection cases are shaped more and more by behavioral scientists. But we decided to be quite open on that. You know, they, they, we didn't start with fixed proportions or different grades. It was more of a sense of trying to bring in the talent, trying to make sure that the talent was kind of fitting in with the rest of the organization. Um, I think there's a big cultural piece in the sense that you need, as an organization, to be open to this kind of energy coming in, trying to fit it in with the rest of the skills. And I think the board has been very supportive, the rest of the leadership team in the CMA, uh, 
compared to others, I mean, our, the way we are set up, we have quite a lot of flexibility in the way we manage uh, our budgets, so we can allocate money to particular activities. So that, that has helped uh, doing that. I mean, one of the key questions for us going forward is if we get these uh, powers of digital regulation in the DMU, as we hope and as the government has promised, the CMA will move from being a, a sort of a pure play competition authority to becoming a hybrid competition authority and regulator. And personally, I'm very comfortable with that. I think it makes a lot of sense. But I think culturally, the, the organization will have to change and take that role, which also means that you, as Bill was saying, you have a big portfolio of remedies, potentially a growing portfolio of remedies, and more and more of your work and your effectiveness is about those remedies uh, actually working in practice in markets. We spent quite a lot of time thinking about career paths. I think that's still very much work in progress. So a number of the people who have come in uh, don't see themselves for life as people who you know, worry about antitrust and regulation. They, uh, they came in as specialists and probably they thought, you know, we're going to leave the CMA and do another job in the private sector as specialists. And, and, and there is a genuine question there about traction and retention, and in many ways, something which is, again, very much work in progress, I think the, the same way economies became more and more influential in the running agencies over the last 20 years, I think technologies have become more and more relevant in the policy discussions within agencies in uh, shaping the policies and also in becoming part of the senior leadership of organizations, and that's not where we are today in the CMA, and that's something that I think my successor will have to, to, to think about because I think it's, uh, it's self-evident that a lot of the priorities are shaped by a number of people in the senior leadership team and their, their lived experiences and their skills have a big role in that. So I think that's an era that needs to, to change. Um, working with others is a big deal, as Bill was saying. I think we've been always very open. So we do a lot of work domestically. We've created this Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum. We have. John here, who heads the, the ICO and, uh, we, and the uh, Ofcom, which is the telecom and media regulator and financial services regulator, work together with us. And for instance, quite a lot of the horizon scanning we're now increasingly doing through this forum because, again, there are massive overlaps and synergies. So, for instance, the last few months we did quite a lot of work on algorithmic auditing, which unsurprisingly was a key concern for all of us looking at the different functions. And then the international piece is clearly very, very important. There are lots of touch points in the CMA. I think this conference is very much an, an example of that. Stefan has done a great job in, again, linking up with a lot of his counterparts globally, and this is going to become ever more important. And again, we are certainly interested in doing joint market studies with our counterparts internationally. We have discussed with some of the people in this panel. Uh, so there is more and more joined up work. I mean, obviously, there are legal barriers and some of the issues are, are not immediately solvable, but I think there is a strong desire for that. So f f final uh, couple of points in terms of what, what is on the agenda, what is work in progress. I'd say number one, um, litigation uh, strategies in the sense that more and more of these cases, our case work will be in the digital space, we'll use more and more uh, technology input, big data, empirical analysis, Economics will be mixed much more with uh, documents, data, and technology. And again, we need to write, have the right narrative and, and convince the course is the right way of doing it. We had a judgment yesterday in our meta Giphy case, which in many ways was quite supportive of the work we did there, particularly on the substantive issues. So I think that's quite uh, encouraging for us. Um, secondly, I think it's a big exercise for all of us in applying digital transformation to our agencies and our processes. I think that's obviously an issue for uh, all companies, but I think probably we as public sector bodies are a bit behind the curve. So that's an area where uh, I think we just need to think more and more about how we can automate processes and trying to get efficiencies out of it. And then the final point, as I said, I think this very much is work in progress about having technologists shaping more and more the policy choices and the, and the priorities uh, of the agencies by being more and more part of the senior leadership teams and the, and the boards in structures like ours. Uh, so that's what I wanted to say by way of introduction. Thanks, Bill. Thanks so much, Andrea, for getting us off to a great start and underscoring, among other things, that it's 
not just enough to bring in the individuals, but to integrate them in an effective way into the development of the program and apply them over time. Olivier. Yeah, well, thanks. And thanks for your thought-provoking remarks. I mean, I, there's a lot of food for thought in what you said in, in introduction. I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, congratulate, I think it's the right time to congratulate you, Andrea, for the achievements, uh, in particular in this field. Uh, so uh, you certainly have been busy, you definitely have been productive, and uh, I hope by the metrics of, uh, uh, of Bill that you've been uh, effective as well. Um, Thanks. But that's only future <laughs> tells in general. Um, well, I mean, to answer the question, I mean, I thought about maybe you first need to look outside and then, then turn to inward looking. I mean, outside, of course, we have the big platforms, the DMA, to, well, we'll not bore you with this, but we, Tons of, uh, tons of conferences on, on, on the issue, but uh, I mean, that's a reality. The world is changing, and um, the challenges we face are changing as well, even if when you look at platform behavior, in the end of the day, if you peel the onion at the core, you find the very same old practices we all we knew. I mean, they didn't invent uh, leveraging, they didn't invent bundling, tying, and all these sort of things. But the challenge is to get to the core. Uh, really, and, and that's, that's enough of a challenge in itself. And also, outside of the platform economy, um, I mean, digital is everywhere, and it changes the way market works everywhere. It's difficult for us to understand. And finance is an example Benoit and I know very well, where well, digital is very, very big and, and makes a very big transformation that impacts competition issues, like in payments, for example. Um, that impacts also very trivial things, like how you make cartels. You make cartels on the internet. You get a private chat room on the dark web somewhere, so no need to book a hotel in the Bahamas and, uh, and have discussions anymore. Uh, so all this needs for us to, to adapt. So now if I look on in the inside, I mean, I think like CMA, we've started that journey a long time ago. When I was director for cartels, which is a bit more than 10 years ago, we started what we called for the Forensic IT Lab, which was basically, it was the infancy in these days of uh, more sophisticated ways of uh, uh, doing cartels, and, uh, and we started the policy response. But of course, it's traditional, but first of all, administration have less financial means, staff means, than, than uh, uh, private firms. And secondly, they always have a first mover advantage, of course. You're lagging behind, trying to catch up all the time. So <clears throat> we've, been, we've been growing that over time. Today, to give you a, an idea, more than half of my budget is dedicated to this type of issues. I mean, it's digital, basically. And it will, and it will grow. And the other half, if I, if I, I carve out uh, staff expenses, of course, is, is studies and mission. Uh, but but kind of fifty seven percent is digital, and so we invest a lot on it and and of course it will only go bigger with the dma so in two thousand and sixteen we decided we should we should go bigger with this, so we created a full unit um, and it it proved very effective in assisting it was the cartel directorates in assisting uh, cartel investigations, but very very quickly we realized that it it became increasingly used by everything else but cartels, and in particular mergers. Uh, because, of course, in merger, we tend to... I, I remember in the 90s, we were making fun of the US when they had to rent a building to, to store the boxes because they, they were requesting so many documents. Uh, to be fair, today... I read it, every one of them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but to be fair, today, if we, if we had to get the, the documents we request on paper, uh, we would have to rent several buildings as well. So the question is, once you have requested all these documents, what do you do with them? And of course, you need to, your resources, staff resources are constrained, so you need to find smart ways to see patterns, to associate leads, facts. So we started to invest a lot in uh, uh, IA, basically, to do this, as, as other authorities are, are doing, uh, uh, as the colleagues, I'm sure Lina will mention are doing in the US as well. Um, so that's, that's a journey. Of course, the DMA will 
change all, all of this because with the DMA we will need to grow much bigger in terms of, for example, the number of data scientists we have, uh, the tools we have to deal with, uh, uh, with the flow of data we will receive. Um, so that the, the game will change and this is where, I mean, we, the only way to face it in our view in the Commission is a cooperative game. We will never have in comp enough data scientists to do all of this. So the first, the first decision we took, Roberto Viola, who is my colleague uh, running Connect, so he's in charge of the implementation of the DSR. We are uh, jointly in charge of the DMA. We decided to pool our data scientists. We decided not to have a pool that does DMA and a pool that does DSA. Uh, because there is a lot of commonalities and we want to be able to focus a, a, I mean, a, a big enough uh, uh, staff force on one single issue for a defined period of time if we need. Um, so that's, that's the first thing, but, but even that is not enough. Uh, and uh, we need to pull further for two reasons, uh, or two dimensions actually. The first one is what we're talking about is at the crossroad of many things. Yes, it's competition. But yes, it's regulation, and yes, it's privacy, and yes, it's data regulation, and yes, well, it's many other things. It's consumer protection. Um, we are only interested with competition in the antitrust sense of it. Some of the colleagues are antitrust with also consumer protection, and some with many other things. Um, so the issue here is uh, how do you manage to reconcile the various objectives while not distorting uh, the implementation of your competition tool, because if you do this, not only you don't do your job, but you likely will lose your case in court. Um, so how do we pull resources, at the same time sort out the results so that each of us can do his part of the job, will be, in my view, one of the fundamental issues in, in going forward in the digital transformation. The same goes that uh, Benoit, who mentioned that in Berlin, between the national competition authorities and the commission. I mean, of course we should pull resources as well, uh, in particular to help the smallest jurisdictions to crack big cases or complex cases. Um, it's ridiculous to have one data scientist in country A, two in country B. Well, of, co of course they will never have more and we will never have more than what we have, but maybe we can help each other and uh, that we can only do if we are able to internalize early enough the constraint of transmission of information. How can I have somebody from France working in one of my cases or in a German case? It's not terribly complex, but if you don't foresee it in advance, you don't get the legal structure for this, and then you take legal risks going forward further. So we, we should think about that um, as well. So, and finally, maybe one thing is Tech is so much present across the board, of course in DMA going forward, but in all fields of antitrust and mergers. And I, we're seriously reflecting in the Commission and I think in other authorities as well to have what I would call a chief technology officer. I mean, somebody modeled on a chief economist that brings to the institutions kind of state of the art knowledge from the outside on a temporary basis. And, but who is able to have this horizontal view and coordinate uh, technology issue across the board. Yeah, that's great, Olivier. And I, I think emphasizing, you, as you did, ha that it might not be necessary for every agency or even possible to establish this deep collection of expertise. But if you have a network that's effective, you can draw upon the network to, to provide yep. what you need. And, uh, as you say, in the, in the face of the complexity brought about by the multidisciplinary nature of the, of the field. I mean, the, the uh, conferences that I attend, when they talk about tech, say you don't simply need the data technologists or the lawyer or the economists. You need the anthropologists, <laughs> the sociologists, mm -hmm. the psychologists mm -hmm. who understand what it's actually doing to the society, the way people live, the way in which they buy things, no. use things. Uh, and, and this, I think, suggests a, a wider range of collaboration, uh, both across agencies and with institutions outside to get our arms around what's, what's taking place. But 
but thank you. Uh, Lena, if we can uh, please turn to you. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, thanks, Bill, and thanks to the CMA for hosting this really timely and salient discussion. Uh, we at the FTC are grappling daily with questions around how we can be making these investments and updating our tools to make sure we're fully equipped to detect, analyze, and remedy unlawful unlawful conduct, um, especially in digital markets. Um, and as Bill well knows, you know, this embedded in the DNA of the FTC and one reason why Congress created the agency was to make sure we had a set of experts that were fully able to keep pace with changing markets and technologies. And so this really goes to the heart of our mission and, and mandate. Um, this is something that we've been very focused on. Um, and there are a few key pillars to our approach. Um, so first, we've been seeking to invest in our capacity to fully grasp and understand new and emerging technologies. Um, our talented lawyers and economists are no strangers to this. I'm constantly awed by their ability to be fully grasping arcane and highly specialized markets, especially in merger review. But as we've heard from, from many others, there's just an enormous amount to be gained by incorporating a greater set of analytical tools and skill sets into the agency's work and to be fostering greater collaboration among these disciplines. Um, so like many of our counterparts um, at the FTC, this has involved increasing our use of technologists alongside our skilled lawyers, economists, and investigators. Uh, we don't have the ability to just summon an increase in our budget, so for the most part, as of right now, we've been uh, leaning heavily on details from other agencies, um, IPAs, uh, creative ways to, to be increasing the number of technologists in the building while we're still waiting for Congress to increase our budget to fully equip us to invest in it. Um, and we've been able to increase the number of technologists uh, quite significantly, drawing from a diverse set of skill sets, including data scientists and engineers, uh, user design experts and AI researchers, and we're looking to continue building up this team. Um, as we heard from Andrea, you know, getting the right people in the building, of course, is only the first part of the challenge. There are core institutional and organizational design questions associated with how you fully integrate and deploy these skills. Um, and even within the last year, it's been very clear how important it is to be fully embedding those technologists within our investigative teams and having them be involved from the get-go uh, to fully be able to shape the trajectory of the investigation rather than just be brought in at a later stage where you know the train has left the station. Um, in addition to direct case support, our technologists have also been helping identify potential concerns around emerging technologies and do some of the horizon scanning work. Um, so one area where this has come up is uh, staff across the agency are confronting, for example, uh, virtual reality and, and augmented reality technologies. Um, this is something that's coming up in the context of our merger review and our merger investigations. It's also coming up in the context of our consumer protection work. Um, and so having our technologists on board and able to pull together a resource and expertise and programming um, to be able to inform this work across the agency um, has been a really good model of this and, and something we're looking to replicate and build on across other key technologies and innovations. Um, a second pillar of what we've been looking to do is using this talent as, as part of our investments and upgrades in our tools and frameworks. So we have an ongoing review of our merger guidelines to make sure that in part we're capturing the realities of how firms are using mergers to acquire and maintain market power, especially in digital markets, and to really correct for some of the assumptions that had suggested for example, that the intrinsic dynamism of digital markets weighed in favor of under intervention um, and making sure we're fully incorporating all of the learning around you know, network optionalities, the way in which markets can tip, the self-reinforcing advantages of data, um, incorporating into, into how we're putting together this enforcement manual. Um, we're also in the midst of revision, revision of the merger notification form. Um, so this 
basically designates, identifies what information we're receiving on the front end when parties are making their filings and identifying, are we even receiving it in formats that maximally equip us to make best use of the information? So there's a component of this revision that's based on identifying the information that's needed for the legal analysis, but there's also a technological component to make sure we're receiving it in formats that equip us to make use of it in the most effective and efficient way. Um, we've also um, had our technologists involved in um, crafting and updating model CIDs, um, updating these types of um, CIDs to make sure that we're capturing changes in how firms are storing and exchanging information. Um, so as people are you know, migrating, not just to chat, but other types of uh, information storage in the cloud to, to make sure that when we're collecting information as part of our investigations that we're fully able to capture it and then actually make use of it. Um, and lastly, they've been um, also involved in helping us put together a, a remedies toolkit. So the technologists have been working closely with the staff attorneys to create a digital remedies toolkit, um, for example, for certain types of consumer protection and privacy and data security violations to make sure that our remedies are technologically sound, but also that they're fully depriving the lawbreaker of, of the fruits of the unlawful conduct, um, as well as prescribing best practices. Um, and some of the settlements that we've been able to move forward with over the last few months um, have really reflected, for example, the state of the art in data security practices to make sure that what we're prescribing um, is really keeping pace with the latest set of, of learnings um, in the market. Um, third, we're, we're taking an interdisciplinary approach and, and really investing in our research capacities. So in as much as we have you know, competition, consumer protection, and privacy, making sure that we're making full use of, of each of those lenses when assessing and analyzing conduct. We also, of course, have uh, 6B of the FTC Act, which Congress gave the agency um, to be able to conduct sweeping market inquiries. Um, there were two major um, 6B inquiries that were initiated under my predecessor in the context of digital markets. Um, so one was a, a inquiry into non-reportable acquisitions by the nation's five largest technology companies. Um, last fall, we were able to issue a preliminary report that showed some of the findings and, and helped us identify both the specific markets where these tech firms were most acquisitive in ways that was falling below our radar, um, as well as identifying for us, you know, are there potential tweaks that we could be making, for example, to the reporting requirements that would let us uh, capture a greater set of these acquisitions. Um, there was another 6B that was initiated, um, very <laughs> sweeping 6B, uh, looking at social media practices and video, video streaming practices uh, more broadly. Um, so that's, that's an inquiry that's ongoing where we're still digesting the information and data and, and figuring out how best to make use of it. Um, we're looking to also identify additional areas where we think there are key information asymmetries or blind spots um, where our use of 6B could, could really help um, mitigate some of that. Um, and lastly, lastly, we've been uh, building our relationships and, and investing in collaboration. Um, so this is, you know, within the U.S. with other agencies. Uh, the Biden administration has put a lot of emphasis on what they call a whole of government approach to competition policy. Uh, we're taking that spirit and uh, applying it across our work. So especially with other agencies that also have deep technological expertise and skill sets, uh, such as um, the Department of Homeland Security, that's oftentimes on the front lines, for example, of uh, cybersecurity breaches, um, deepening our relationships and partnerships with them so that we can um, be in closer contact when there are certain incidents and, and have a more cohesive uh, public response, um, but also invest in, in the type of information sharing um, that can really further empower the FTC. Um, and of course, our international relationships have been really critical here. Um, in particular, uh, the CMA and Andrea and Stefan have been so, so generous with their time and expertise um, as our teams are, are really figuring out how we can be learning from their experience and their ability in a relatively short period of time to really develop such a sophisticated operation. Um, but this really applies across the board. Uh, we've really been prioritizing our engagement with
with international counterparts uh, to make sure that in as much as we have these shared goals, we can be facilitating uh, learning across the board and, and best practices. Um, so I'll leave it there, but thanks again for, for hosting this really important discussion. And I've already learned a, lot, a ton and, and look forward to hearing from the others. Thanks, Lena. I, 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 one, one, one thing among the, the many impressive points you make that I, I, I'm, I'm grateful for is how you link what's happening with digital to a larger re-examination by agencies of everything they do in some ways. That is, how their different capabilities, uh, their different features of their mandate, uh, their individual policy tools can be integrated in a way that provides a better result. If you assume that legislators are not going to step forward and say, how much more money would you like? Uh, instead, they're going to look and say, keep up the good work and do more with what you have. There's an urgency to take what you've already got and make better use of it. Uh, that is to focus on this crucial dimension of policy implementation and do better. And uh, uh, everything you mentioned on your agenda, Lena, is, uh, is, is pointed in the direction of thinking about how to do that until the day comes when, uh, when that great, famous, infinite uh, uh, body of resources comes our way. Uh, Benoit. <coughs> Thank you, Bill, and uh, thank, you, thank you for the uh, thoughtful uh, comments you shared earlier in the discussion. And, and thank you very much to Andrea, to, uh, to Stefan, and to the uh, CMA uh, team for uh, putting this conference together uh, in beautiful London. I mean, you can, you can see on screen how beautiful the weather is outside in London, but it's a, it's a beautiful day. Um, I, um, maybe what, what could be, what could be uh, helpful for the discussion would be for me to share a few thoughts I've collected over the year. Uh, the first uh, four months uh, I've been in office, uh, and, and which can be relevant to, the, uh, to today's discussion. And I would like to start from a slightly different uh, angle, which is more about the instruments, the enforcement instruments that we yes. have uh, to address dig di digital cases. And then I come back to resources and skills, which have been very much in the focus already. And starting with the instruments, I think what I've seen so far uh, is that uh, we, uh, we've really benefited a lot from, being, uh, from, from availing from a broad set of instruments, from a, from a broad and deep and broad toolbox. Uh, and that's about uh, fines, of course, and commitments also uh, about interim measures, which we've been using increasingly to address digital cases, uh, and maybe uh, eventually also st structural, structural uh, uh, injunctions, structural orders, uh, which of course are, uh, uh, are also part of the toolbox. And what I've seen so far is that uh, first, um, we, um, um, there are instruments that can help us to act very quickly, which is uh, even more important uh, on, in digital cases and in, in general, uh, and that's in particular about interim uh, measures which we've been able to use, for instance, to uh, order uh, uh, incumbents in the energy sector to share data with their competitors, or also in the Google uh, case uh, with uh, publishers, um, which is close to the bargaining code, which, uh, uh, which Gina knows very well. <laughs> it's a similar, similar set of issues uh, where we've been able to order Google to negotiate in good faith with publishers, including by sharing data uh, which is relevant to the valuation of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of copyright, uh, which they weren't doing. Uh, and so that has been very useful, but uh, it's, it's, it's often a, co a combination of instruments, actually. So f coming back to the Google case, I mean, initially, uh, we, uh, we used, uh, we used uh, interim measures, and then uh, it just happened that they, they, they didn't, Google did not comply with interim measures. So we had to find Google, 500 million, and then they started. Then the discussion started. So uh, it's a little bit like this, uh, you know, this Teddy Roosevelt quote: uh, uh, <laughs> "Speak softly and carry a big stick." <laughs> right? So you need you need you need both types of instruments, uh, and that has been the lesson. Uh, but the lesson also, and here I'm going to get slightly more controversial, is that um, sometimes you need to know how to use the instruments. Sometimes you also need to know to know how not to use the instruments. Um, and uh, you need to de delineate very carefully uh, what belongs to competition law and, and policy and action and what, uh, what belongs to other fields of regulation. And I think privacy is, is, is really a case in point where, uh, I mean, that, that, that could be an, 
it's an entirely, <laughs> it's, an, it's a very important discussion on its own, but to put it simply, we know that there are key complementarities and, 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 and there, is, there are key alignment, area of alignment between uh, competition and privacy, but we also know that there can be trade-offs uh, and there are different perspectives. And uh, I think that in, on privacy as on other matters, we should uh, resist uh, what I would call the competition hubris, which is to try to solve everything with competition instruments. Competition tools can be very powerful, Maybe they're not powerful enough. So I know, I know that many people around think, think that we should be bolder and we should act earlier and more swiftly, etc. And that's, that might all be true. But compared to other regulatory fields, competition tools are more, uh, can be more powerful, uh, particularly in terms of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the magnitude of fines, for instance. Yeah. Uh, and so we should not be shy uh, in using these, these instruments. When, you, when, you, when we use them, we should use them swiftly and boldly. I agree with that. But um, sometimes uh, it doesn't provide for a, uh, for a, for a long-lasting solution, for a steady-state solution. So if I come back again to this Google and, and, and uh, publishing rights uh, issue, uh, we've acted uh, and will soon, within a few uh, weeks, if not days, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll release our decision on this case and, uh, and whether we are happy or not with Google's commitments. But I don't think that uh, regulating copyrights uh, belongs to the core remit of a competition authority. So that might be my only uh, dissent uh, with Andrea. I mean, I agree with 98% of what Andrea said, uh, but uh, I'm not very keen to become a regulator, honestly. Uh, I don't think that, uh, I, I don't want to, to, to start regulating copyrights, press copyrights. I think that, uh, Try that there are other places. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm currently doing it somehow. Uh, <laughs> but at some point, I will hand it over to the government and tell them, look, that's how far we've, we've, we've been. And uh, please pass it into law and, uh, and make, it some, make, make, it, make it something that, that can be permanent. I don't think that we, could, we, we can do that. So what I'm saying here is that we, we should also be aware of the limits of what we are doing and that society can have different priorities. If, you, if you're coming back to privacy, for instance, which is a key uh, issue we've got to deal with when dealing with digital and with, and with data, um, society can have different priorities. And yes, our instruments are probably more powerful than any instrument that a privacy uh, or a data protection authority can avail of. But at some point, if this goes to uh, appeal courts, if this goes to the European Court of Justice, if this goes to a, if this becomes a political discussion, privacy will prevail because it's a, it's a, fun, it's a fundamental right, which competition is not. Uh, and so you've got to be aware also of the broader societal uh, priorities and, uh, and be uh, at some point humble in what you want to achieve and what you don't want to achieve. So that was my kind of first set of, of, of comments uh, on, the, on the instruments. Now coming back to the, to the discussion on, uh, on uh, skills and capability, I agree with a lot of what has been said. Uh, I agree that we, uh, it's a duty for us to, uh, to, to shape up and to, uh, to strengthen our capability. Um, in our case, our capability is still, uh, is still uh, 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 in the making, I would say. We have, we have a wonderful uh, digital economy unit uh, led by uh, Jan Gutmann, who's here today, and he will be on the, pan on the, on the concluding panel tonight. Uh, and they've, they've been doing fantastic work, but there are five, right? It's five, five of them. And then we have excellent specialists of various aspects of the digital economy uh, elsewhere in the, uh, in the authority. But, uh, and I'm, I'm sure at some point I will go to Parliament and ask for more. Uh, but that's, that's never got going to be enough. So we also need to uh, pool resources. As Olivier said, we need to pool resources better in the European system across uh, national competition authorities and with the Commission. So having at some point some kind of uh, data hub or innovation hub uh, uh, or competition hub uh, that would kind of uh, pool resources and provide resources to all competition agencies, in my view, would make sense. And it's perfectly uh, legal under European law to do that. It would be more difficult at a global level, but at a European level, mm -hmm. we have the legal basis to do it. Um, and we also need to pool resources better with, uh, with other uh, agencies. We are doing it with the government, by the way. Occasionally, we are tapping resources from the Ministry of Economy in Paris. And uh, legally, we can appoint uh, uh, these guys uh, as uh, external case handlers. So they, have, they, can have, they can be part of the full process uh, for a limited period of time. And that helps us to really to tap the right resources in terms of, uh, in terms of data science. It's more than data science. Uh, it's more than technology. Um, fundamentally, I think what's missing is a, uh, uh, the, the, the capability for us to, um, 
to, uh, to scan the horizon, as, uh, as Andrea said earlier, and to understand business models better, uh, which is something that bureaucrats don't do very well, to be honest, <laughs> usually, uh, because if you want to understand what uh, companies are, 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 are up to, uh, you need a, a minimum uh, commonality of, of, of minds. You need to be on the same, uh, on the same uh, you need a, a, a minimum commonality of mindsets, right? Which we don't have because we are fundamentally bureaucrats, right? So I've been, I've been part of that kind of exercise in my previous job at the, at the Bank for International Settlement where we had created this innovation hub. And a lot of the effort was not about the technology itself, it was about the mindset. It was about trying to understand how people can work in an agile environment, how they can uh, ideate new projects, how they can fail forward, which is very much not what central bankers do, right? And so we have a little bit the same kind of issues here that we have to import that mindset in our own institutions and that's, in my view, uh, the, uh, the, most, uh, the, most, uh, uh, the most difficult part of it. Um, maybe one last remark which is related is um, I think the, dis the distinction between the digital economy and the non-digital economy is entirely artificial because digital is everywhere. It kind of permeates all industries now. Uh, retail, uh, uh, TV, I mean everything is, 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 is getting digital. So we still have a few non-digital cases. We had a wonderful case earlier this year about uh, how cats and dogs are being shipped from Europe to Polynesia. That's, that's a fantastic uh, uh, case for, for an enforcer to, to look into. But most other cases are partly or entirely digital. So um, you need to understand how the business model will change throughout the economy. And, uh, uh, and you need the right uh, set of instruments and legal framework to do it. And that's, that's really difficult. Because your, 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 code between, your code between a rock and a hard place, either you look back and, uh, at, at how companies have been doing things, which is a little bit what the DMA does, with all due respect. The DMA is a little bit like at a given point in time, we make sense of everything we've been doing over the last 15 years, and we kind of crystallize everything in a, in a text, and, and, uh, and it will help us uh, uh, streamline processes looking forward. And, and it's great. And it, it's going to be very useful. But if you think of, of how data now is being used in the car industry or in the healthcare industry, um, we don't know what the business models will be. We know what the, what we know what the business model is in uh, online advertising because we have all this story of case decisions which we could uh, encapsulate into the DMA, and, and that has been very useful. But I don't know yet how car makers will use data. I, I don't know whether it will be uh, like vertical uh, integration uh, around different car makers or uh, whether there will be some kind of standard, uh, some kind of Android of cars that will emerge uh, and whether a car will look like big iPhones with a, uh, with a, uh, with a common standard to, uh, to handle data. I just don't know. And, and that's, that's life, but we have to prepare for it. And in that sense, I'm a little bit more worried, worried about the Data Act in Europe than about the DMA because the Data Act is about regulating uh, business models that, that haven't emerged yet. And so you need a lot of uh, capability to project yourself and to understand what the business is up to, uh, and that's really where we should be investing. Yeah, that's great, Benoit. I, th I think, I think you, you underscore, too, that there are a variety of places you can look to get the capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, the, the challenge, how do you understand what's going on uh, in a meaningful way, but you can, you can grow it organically inside. We've been talking about that. You can build partnerships with other public institutions uh, to do this. Uh, I think in many ways, uh, academic hubs can provide uh, a source of partnership too. I mean, I think, I think of the, the academic powerhouses in France. I mean, the, the, the team in Toulouse, just to pick one, but mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a regulatory hub like Paris Dauphine. I mean, there's so many resources that can be drawn in there too to, to, to perform this, this, uh, this frightfully difficult task. I should have mentioned before that uh, you know we have a range of experiences here. Andre has been doing this a little bit longer. Uh, Olivier, a little bit in between, but so many years in comp. Benoit, relatively near to this. Happy first anniversary, Lena. I think this is uh, year one <laughs> of Chair uh, uh, term, June 15th. And, and we turn to another recent, recent addition to the community. Uh, and and that's, uh, that's Gina, uh, who's, whose work already has been mentioned by our colleagues. Gina, uh, could you take it from here, please? Thanks very much, Bill, and thanks for the challenges really you threw out to us. 
and also to Andrea and Stefan for including the ACCC, including Jane Lynn, who heads our unit, who is there with you in London and other members of our team. The, our ACCC Strategic Data Analysis Unit was established in 2017 with an initial focus of supporting market inquiries. It grew to include merger assessments, then to embrace consumer and competition investigations and enforcement cases. The team gradually recruited stat statisticians, data scientists from other agencies, as well as computer science and mathematics graduates joining our behavioral economists as well at the ACCC. In 2021, the unit combined with our info center, which receives over 350,000 complaints every year, our intelligence team and the legal technology unit to form a united data and intelligence branch, which today has approximately 85 staff members. When we look at the work that the branch is doing, I think, Bill, I can show how it is improving the effectiveness of our role across each of our functions, competition, consumer, infrastructure, regulatory, and market studies. And I'd look at that, looking at the work in three categories, emphasizing the link between the data analysis that they are doing and better decision-making. Our decision-making both strategically in helping to set our priorities, our decision-making operationally, how we can work better, and our tactical decisions on specific cases and projects. To give one example in our strategic work, our DNI branch have several projects underway that seek to build capability for proactive detection of emerging competition and consumer issues. One is a search tool we're calling Trader360 that brings together data from a range of sources coming into the agency to provide a comprehensive profile of a trader. It's like looking at the usual suspects and its interactions with the agency. Next, we're looking to extend the functionality of Trader360 to include risk ratings and to build a similar tool for reporting on emerging product safety issues. I'm moving to the tactical contributions, which are very significant. So the team firstly identifies the data sources, both within the agency and exter externally relevant to the claims and hypotheses of harm, defines terms relating to data and algorithms in our information gathering notices, analyzes data to surface the patterns and trends that you were describing before, Bill, which are essential so that we can actually understand what's going on. Analyzing algorithms, including machine learning algorithms and explaining how they work. And very importantly, including when we get to court, translating technical jargon for non-technical audiences. I want to take two examples. The first is an enforcement case and the second is a mergers case. So the first is an investigation commenced in 2017 against Travago and online tourism uh, comparison website, which misleadingly represented that it was displaying offers on its website in response to searches that displayed the cheapest offers for the relevant hotel rooms. The team assisted uh, first in the investigation, but then in court to succeed uh, for the court to make the finding on liability because the analysis that was done on the information and the source code comprising the algorithms established that the algorithm weighted the commission paid to Travago by booking sites and the choice of offers more highly than the level of the price that the consumer would pay for the hotel room. In addition, the SDAU helped the case team quantify the benefit extracted by Travago and the harm suffered by consumers so that we could put compelling penalty propositions to the court. This was in addition to giving data related advice relevant to pleadings, discovery and expert witnesses. We succeeded in that case in the court. The second is in relation to a merger case. This was a case between toll road concession owners, the acquirer holding interest in 15 of the 19 toll road concessions in Australia. But on a standard analysis, none covered similar areas point to point. Um, so we didn't have a direct um, competitive overlap. But what the SDAU team analysis showed by analyzing Transurban's traffic modeling 
central to calculating its expected revenue and hence bid price was it showed the data held exclusively by Transurban as a result of operating other toll roads, which was used in that modeling. So as part of the uh, data capacity that was fundamental to its uh, business and competitive position. While the commission didn't impose, oppose the proposed acquisition, it did subject uh, the transaction to a remedy requiring the acquirer to publish certain traffic data publicly for use by future rivals, which was informed by that analysis. Looking at the overall approach and to the key question you asked, how are we going to learn from what the mistakes we made improve our effectiveness into the future? I think the key part is to foster the capacity of our team to be adaptable and to change. <clears throat> we have sought to include multidisciplinary teams building upon the people we brought in from outside, joining those who are already within the agency, who are skilled and empowered to take creative approaches to solving problems. We're seeking to diversify our workforce, to value different specialty expertise, and to ensure that our people have access to ongoing development opportunities, such as attending this conference. <clears throat> We're also trying to seize upon the opportunities as well as the challenges as we expand our monitoring capabilities and we are almost every day being given a new monitoring role by our government under pressure cost of living energy prices petrol prices etc we're seeking to refine methods with the data that we gather to detect structural and behavioral anom anomalies to increase the likelihood of detecting new issues as they emerge. As we grow in the data we gather, we're seeking to grow in our capacity to understand it and what it is telling us, to improve our proactive detection uh, capacity as a strategic capability. And we are looking forward to our representatives at the conference to hear how other agencies are investing in this area. Finally, looking to this, which is a great example of interagency collaboration, we collaborate with domestic <clears throat> agencies. We're working currently on a plan with the financial services regulators in Australia to gather data on debanking, to look at the circumstances in which debanking is occur occurring and its impact, particularly upon new models of business and new competitors and where they are being denied <clears throat> the services from uh, basic banking uh, services. We also have internationally strong ties with many of the agencies at this conference, including direct liaison between our respective data teams. We're envisaging that over time, we're not only going to share methodologies and information, but also our self-generated code and are starting to have some examples of that with the CMA. And we would also uh, welcome opportunities to work collaboratively on interjurisdictional investigations. We agree with the comment that each of the members of this panel have made that by coordinating our efforts, we can increase our collective capability to identify and respond to the emerging issues and particularly the significant pace of change that we're all facing. Thanks very much, Bill. Thank you, Gina, and uh, you know, so, so true your observation about the, uh, uh, again, the remarkable challenge that comes at the agencies from having some of these new functions such as monitoring. How do you monitor uh, effectively uh, where governments expect agencies, uh, uh, a paradox, for example, of, of effective agencies, and I think we have them here, we have them on the screen too, uh, is, is that the better you are at what you do, you get more people asking you to do things. Uh, and not with, more, not with more resources to do it, but just do more. And uh, this involves monitoring, uh, solving climate change, bringing petrol prices down, uh, doing, doing, uh, doing all these things at one time. And, and how do you get your arms around the information that's required to do a good monitoring project? Again, again here, I, I look at the CMA experience and I'm so struck at during COVID, what a wonderful job Stefan and his colleagues did in simply getting an idea of what was going on uh, and being a resource for government on that. Uh, I have a couple of questions here and I, I just, I thought I'd boil them down to a, a single query for our, for our panel before we close at the, uh, at the bottom of the hour and, and maybe your, your short thoughts on this. If you, if you look ahead at 
where you would like to see the technological analysis capability of the agency be and how it's being used over time. Um, where would you like to see your agency five years hence? What would you like to see it being able to do? Andrea, if I could come back to you. Yeah, so I think it would be pretty radical restructuring of the agency in the sense that uh, a lot of the problems you would apply immediately a sort of digital tech lens to them as well, yes. not, not exclusively the kind of legal and economic lens we apply now. So I think there are, so for instance, the monitoring point, you know, if we get a letter today from the government asking us to do monitoring in a particular sector, to be honest, the CMA today will react with the kind of economic analysis from 10, 15 years ago in terms of the monitoring. I'm sure there are people with big data who have smart ideas about how to do it in a more effective way, but they are not in the, C I mean, maybe Stefan, some of the people here have, but I think there are, th 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 there are lots of things that are helpful to us that are out there that we're not quite using or absorbing today. And I think we, we've done quite a lot, but I think we, this is an area where probably one needs to be more radical than we've been so far. Thank you, Olivier. A uh, quick thought about where you'd like to be five years from now. Well, very quickly, I, what I would hope is that we manage in five years to travel the same journey with, in terms of incorporating data scientists and all sorts of uh, different profile as the one we've been doing over almost 20 years in incorporating more economists um, in order to reach uh, really a, a better blend of uh, skills and competencies. Yeah. Lena. Um, I would echo much of that. I mean, I think um, having technologists be an institutionally embedded skill set, um, similar to the way that economists are at the agency, I think would be a big step forward. And, and having that as a readily available lens through which we do all of our work, I think will be, is an aspiration. Great, Benoit? Um, well, it's very, it's very simple, and it's good that you picked uh, five years, because that's exactly my term. <laughs> <The authority. laughs> it sounds like a good horizon for me. Um, it's a, it's a very simple answer. It's like it's when in five years, when a new antitrust case uh, or a new merger review comes, I want to be able to say, look, oh, we've looked into it one year ago or two years ago, and not ten years ago, and we had this uh, sectoral study or we had this report one year ago, and we're able to say today, when it comes to um, online advertising. Uh, we'll be able to do it when it comes to uh, to the cloud industry because we are doing it now. Um, we haven't done it for uh, health data or car data, uh, and there will be new issues coming over the next five years. So I just want to be able to say that. That'd be a great answer. Gina. Uh, I'd like, uh, in a very similar fashion, to be able to look back confidently as to what we've learned, but also much more proactively to look forward uh, we, we are looking, attempting to build these skills in a pipeline sense, um, for instance, to look at the extent to which we can use social media data to identify emerging issues. Um, however, we are still, as I know many people in this conference will be talking to, we are still seeking to look at how predictively we can use the data that we have. And I would hope in five years, which also happens like Benoit to be my term, that we will have been able to have established a number of projects which give us confidence in being able to use the data in a predictive way. I want to thank all of you for giving us, uh, I think what strikes me as a very sanguine view of public administration. Innovative, creative, experimental, thoughtful, forward-looking. And if you had any doubt about whether government agencies in our field are looking ahead in a way that is very, very helpful and I think encouraging, you heard it today. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Uh, thank you very much. We've now got a short coffee break, so I look forward to seeing you in a bit over 20 minutes. Thanks. See, it was, it was just in time. So. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next keynote. Um, uh, Tim Wu, as uh, I'm sure you are all well aware, is the White House Special Advisor to the President on Technology and Competition Policy. Uh, you'll all be aware of his work um, when it comes to uh, uh, actually coining the term net neutrality and his work on net neutrality to the uh, the attention merchants. Uh, he's really done uh, so much for our community already, um, and I'm particularly looking forward to hearing his keynote. So over to you, Tim. Thank you very much for that uh, for that, for that uh, introduction, and I'm I'm um, really regret not uh, being there. Just some things are. Uh, uh, I, uh, it's, a, it's a, a serious regret, particularly because I heard the weather is nice. I got to say, over here it's like 100 degrees. You can probably see we're uh, we're we're sweating. Well, here's what I wanted to, to talk about. I wanted to um, spend the next uh, 15 uh, minutes um, talking a little bit about uh, what the White House uh, and the Biden administration are up to, and um, and then talk a little bit about uh, this this uh, intersection. Um, between data and uh, rhetoric, I guess I'd say. Um, and uh, I think that's a, a topic of, of interest uh, to me, hopefully to you as well. Well, let me say a few things first about what uh, we've been up to. Um, uh, as you know, uh, competition, or as you may know, competition policy has been a big deal for the Biden administration, um, sometimes uh, referred to as the third uh, pillar of the economic uh, plan. Um, and uh, uh, we have uh, in uh, this administration formed a competition council, which is comprised of all the agencies that have authorities which are relevant to competition. So not just the uh, two antitrust agencies, the FTC and justice, but other agencies like Department of Transportation, um, Health and Human Services, um, uh, the Defense Department and so forth. And, uh, uh, we're coming up on the first anniversary of uh, the executive order and the creation of the council, 
which um, uh, we have, uh, I guess, uh, watch for it in July. We're going to have um, a series of new announcements. And um, I'm just putting uh, people on notice of that. Um, let me say a few things about the sort of philosophy um, and the turn uh, this administration has done. Uh, when he signed the executive order in uh, uh, last, last year, the president said two things that I think uh, were important for setting the theme. He said, first of all, that um, we weren't really here to destroy capitalism, but to uh, make it work for more people. Uh, actually, the precise line was that uh, capitalism without uh, competition is exploitation. Um, but uh, I think that's the, the idea here. It's not been to, to uh, undermine or uh, destroy innovation um, or competition or any of these things, but frank frankly, make them, make them work the way they should and bring about the kind of widespread prosperity, which has been possible uh, at the best of times in, in this country. Um, second, and I think this was another big significant uh, remark, President said that we were turning the page on a 40-year experiment uh, with minimal antitrust in the uh, more of the Chicago style. You mentioned uh, Robert Bork, uh, you know, a school which often talked a good line on uh, data and so forth, but frankly, an application was often indifferent to the kind of um, uh, serious economics and data, which I know is a subject of this uh, conference. So. Um, I think those phrases sort of set the tone. I, I think we've been moving in a, a direction. We have appointed officials who are serious about law enforcement. Um, not that uh, others uh, weren't, but you know, are, are very uh, serious in seeing um, uh, the, the laws enforced the way they were intended by, by Congress. Uh, Lena Khan, uh, Jonathan Cantor being prime examples. And um, uh, secondly, when it comes to the promotion of competition, as I said earlier, we've taken what's called a whole of government approach, which means uh, all of the agencies are involved and we are constantly um, uh, putting uh, pressure on the agencies to see what they can do to promote competition, uh, lower barriers, promote a vision of the economy that is different than what we've had. And, um, you know, uh, everyone knows that in some ways the best barrier to entry is, is a law or regulation. And I think that has been a significant part of our thinking, uh, as has been the uh, desire to, to uh, fight um, the, the kind of things that make competition more difficult, like cloudy pricing or, or uh, a lack of transparency. I think it's uh, going well. Um, over the last uh, few months, I, our antitrust agencies are on a winning streak. They've seen a, a, an enormous number of mergers a challenge and abandon, um, including a major semiconductor merger, defense industry merger, insurance brokers, sporting goods stores. Uh, there's been a lot of um, uh, challenges. I think that the uh, the uh, industry understands, uh, are starting to understand that the uh, that the the laws are being enforced, and um, I'm, I'm sure there's more to come. So uh, some of the other things that they've been up to, um, uh, we've had. Uh, I think this surprised some people. The Department of Defense is signaling uh, how con concerned it is with consolidation of the defense industrial base in the United States. It's turning the corner, being more careful about procurement policies. And, uh, and uh, uh, I think it's publicly reported um, that did not stand in the way of uh, the Federal Trade Commission challenging a major, a major merger. Uh, the Department of Agriculture uh, is a big deal domestically has uh, been very concerned about, as have we in the White House, about meat packing, meat processing concentration. And they've been both seeding new competitors uh, with a lot of uh, money and, and grants, and also rewriting the rules under the uh, special act called the Packers and Stockyards Act. So uh, those are some of the things we've been up to. I, I won't go on forever, because I don't want to turn this into a huge uh, laundry list, but um, uh, that, that's the kind of stuff. And I, you know, I think it, it cuts new ground for people interested in antitrust have agencies doing rules um, as opposed to just uh, the antitrust uh, agencies bringing cases. Now, there's nothing wrong with cases. I love a good case as much as anyone else. But the rulemaking function is, I think, in some ways, the next uh, dimension. Uh, I'll add to that, there's been a big focus on labor antitrust in this administration. And um, the Department of Treasury uh, here wrote a, a report, which I hope some of you've seen, about the role of, of labor. Uh, among the conclusions was that lack of competition in labor markets has held wages down. Uh, we had a long period in the United States of, of nearly flat uh, wages. Um, and the argument 
is that lack of competition held the wages down by, by approximately 20%. So that's another uh, front. Um, let me turn to my, uh, my next, um, uh, let me turn to my next uh, topic or sort of the main topic that I want to discuss, which is the relationship um, uh, between uh, rhetoric and, and data, which I think is kind of an important uh, thing. Um, I, I wanted, uh, you know, sometimes the uh, turn in antitrust has been linked to various figures uh, in, in history, Thurman Arnold, uh, Louis Brandeis. But I want to focus on Brandeis uh, for a second, because I think there's certain things about the way he approached things that were uh, commendable in terms of this question of, of rhetoric and data. You know, Brand Louis uh, Brandeis uh, uh, realized, and I think it's important that it, it is important the government speak to the people clearly and in ways that are understandable, but what they're doing, um, this is often a challenge for those of us deep in the antitrust world. Uh, you know, we uh, get very deep into jargon very quickly. Um, so I think it is, uh, you know, important that we remember in democracies that we are accountable to people. People need to understand why we're bringing the cases. Um, you know, if big isn't always bad, people uh, have long been uh, suspicious and, and concerned about uh, monopoly power and, and their relative uh, lack of options under it. So I think that's always uh, important. Uh, but, you know, in some ways, um, the uh, what I want to talk about is the fact that while proponents of antitrust enforcement are often accused of sort uh, you know, soaring rhetoric, uh, appeals to emotion and politics, uh, I think it's important to re remember that the uh, some of the, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, opponents of, of uh, or, or those who have uh, been against the antitrust project are themselves um, often uh, in sort of more subtle ways uh, uh, guilty of, uh, of, of relying on a few uh, phrases or, or pat uh, assumptions that uh, have done a lot of, in my view, uh, damage to uh, what is an adequate level of, of antitrust enforcement. Um, you know, let me take an example. It's very uh, common in merger enforcement or when a merger is proposed um, that uh, uh, to claim that the merger will, will create new jobs. Uh, I remember, I won't mention specific mergers, but I can remember merger in recent memory was claimed would, would create, you know, millions, I think a million, millions of jobs, in fact, was the claim. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, uh, or in, in practice, there's often very little data to back up uh, that. Um, efficiencies and merger analysis, they may not um, quite be at the level of um, uh, soaring uh, rhetoric or populist appeal, but, um, you know, the, the, the uh, claims of, of efficiencies um, uh, sort of waved around uh, often are, frankly, in the, in the category, uh, should be considered in the, in the, in the category uh, when they, especially when they they don't pan out or really aren't uh, seriously ones that the companies are merging for as being in this uh, category. Um, Chicago School, my view, um, was fond of uh, a theory of monopoly uh, behavior that I think was its own way of form of rhetoric. Um, the monopolist in this view was a, a timid creature who was uh, scared um, uh, constantly in a state of fear by the merest possibility of entry, would never consider um, raising prices above competitive levels because of that uh, possibility. And, you know, I don't know if that's populist rhetoric, but it's certainly uh, rhetoric. It doesn't seem to match um, uh, the observed conduct uh, and incentives. Uh, in the incentive, uh, in the remedies uh, sphere, I think you, you saw this. I, I don't know how many times I've heard economists, even people who are very serious about data, rely on a phrase like, well, you can't unscramble the eggs. Um, you know, I would... Um, uh, suggests that that's uh, not a scientific uh, statement. Um, and, um, you know, it may be that there are mergers uh, or there are uh, situations where a company has become so integrated that the, the costs uh, of, a, of a breakup are not worth it uh, overall. Although, you know, people have said that about uh, many uh, historic breakups like the AT&T breakup here in the United States. And, um, you know, the, the stirring of the pot, the, the creation of new markets sometimes creates value that grossly overwhelms anything else that we do with antitrust. Um, but uh, I just uh, suggest those things are hard to estimate. We can't uh, have a sort of a line like you can't unscramble the eggs uh, being doing serious uh, work in this area. Um, finally, I think that uh, uh, we've also uh, in recent 
years, um, sometimes seen facts overcome by theory. I'll, I'll mention a specific case in the United States, the uh, uh, Amex or American Express case is an example where the before the district court, the plaintiffs have done a good job of uh, demonstrating um, harm, in fact, from the uh, rules in that case, uh, the uh, steering or, or uh, uh, sometimes called gag rules in that, that case. Uh, they've done a, a good job putting on their case, but somehow the theory of uh, two-sided market analysis uh, trumped the evidence or the facts. And uh, it's another example, uh, you know, while more subtle that the uh, opponents of enforcement use the, the devices and, and tricks of rhetoric to try to hand wave or, or skip what should be uh, a serious, uh, a rigorous analysis. So, you know, I'm gonna um, uh, leave it there with my uh, uh, collection of myths. I don't wanna uh, go on, but I, I wanna say that, um, uh, you know, there is, I, I guess I th think there is a place, um, as I said, for government um, responsible to people to uh, explain what it's doing in terms that are understandable. Um, and uh, what I want to uh, stress is the, the appropriate thing government does, and, you know, this might seem obvious to people, is uh, to do that, uh, but also make sure it has, um, it, you know, the data on its side as well and, and, and the best economics we can, um, while not always speaking in that language. Uh, you know, turning this uh, around slightly, I think we shouldn't assume that because, um, um, uh, you know, you have someone... Uh, uh, who is, uh, has a business background or a, uh, uh, you know, is a, is a highly uh, talented economist. So they don't also rely on, on rhetoric or, or um, unsupportable phrases when, uh, you know, the data runs out and be on, on the guard for that and realize in some cases, uh, you know, we have the data when we have it and otherwise we're using judgment and, you know, to pretend that can be solved by, uh, uh, or that one side has uh, uh, some sort of, uh, obvious advantage when it comes to judgment. It just isn't something we can conclude. So that's uh, what I wanted to say. And um, you know, my, my bottom line is that everyone is going to use uh, rhetoric and strong language and we need to see it um, and use uh, the data best we can as is the goal of this conference. So thanks for having me and I'm uh, looking forward to your questions. Uh, thanks very much, Tim. Uh, First question, so we've been talking quite a lot today about building in non-traditional skills into the ability to take forward uh, you know, antitrust and other competition cases. So uh, we've been talking about technologists, which is so broadly would include data scientists, engineers, um, people working more qualitatively could include behavioral scientists. So you've got a lot of experience of thinking about technology industry. Have you got any thoughts on what agencies sort of could or should be doing in terms of building in these new skill sets? Yeah, no, that's, uh, I think that's been a long-standing uh, uh, desire uh, uh, on uh, of the U.S. agencies uh, to have more uh, people who are, particularly on the tech side, uh, you know, uh, deeper. And I think it's, it's obviously of, of great uh, merit. And one of the things, just to get uh, technical, is I really think it affects um, and should affect how people understand uh, market definition and, and you know, who's competing with whom. Um, I, you know, I think the challenge is when you bring in technologists but don't um, in some ways listen to them. And um, you know, the question is who is competing with whom in a, in a situation where you have a much more plastic uh, technology that can evolve into something else is one that I feel still think hasn't been uh, fully fully uh, reckoned with. And so I think that the challenge, uh, everyone I think probably in this uh, conference and otherwise says, well, it's really great to bring in other people, uh, but in a sense they have to be listened to. And um, you know, their uh, experience with, with how competition uh, works and needs to be given uh, a credit. And I think we haven't fully made uh, that those steps haven't fully understood things like what exclusionary uh, conduct really looks like in, in tech industries, um, or uh, or uh, what what market different competition and substitutes look like, and um, uh, always hoping that somehow we'll get the answers out of traditional microeconomic analysis. So that that's what I think is the the real challenge: just taking that next step beyond just uh, hiring the people and saying that's nice and putting them in a room with a lot of computers. Thank you very much. So I'm going to go on a completely different tack now. So um, picking one of the questions. Thank you very much for submitting them online. Um, 
and I'm going to slightly adapt it. Um, do you think in some cases we should be mandating interoperability? Um, where do you think we should be mandating interoperability and where do you think we should not be? That's a very general, uh, a very general uh, question. Um, although I know there's, I know there's a panel on the whole topic, so I'm nervous to um, uh, opine on uh, a topic. So my uh, instinct um, is that some of the uh, you know greatest gains that we have seen um, in, uh, frankly, what you I guess you'd have to call industrial policy or or economic policy have been from interoperability done at the right time and place. Um, you know, in a sense, uh, you can understand a lot of the most successful telecom regulation, including the first um, uh, interconnection rules um, and uh, some of the uh, phone uh, number sharing rules, um, phone opening rules, you know, in, in telecom, I think you have a, um, a good, a series of examples where you've had interoperability be very successful, but it um, takes a very deft hand because at the same time I can have an enormously uh, long list of failed interoperability efforts, um, usually because they re required way too much effort or expertise on the part of the user. Um, you know, there was this weird, I, I don't want to get too much into it, but the FCC has had a series of sort of doomed efforts to keep uh, set-top box competition alive that usually involve a user having to, you know, request something, um, have it uh, be sent, install themselves, and so forth. So, uh, you know, once in a, as an academic, I once gave a, a talk uh, about, um, actually, this was about um, unbundling, where I said you got to cut at the joints. And I think the, the same thing is true as interoperability, which is, I guess, I'm not in favor of sort of, um, general interoperability uh, principles that you hope will work out. Um, I'm much more in favor of trying to figure out a scenario where it's very realistic that with a minimum amount of user activity, uh, you'll actually get new competition. Um, uh, where somehow, and you know, it's hard, it's fact specific, uh, switching um, phone services and bringing your, your number along is a good example of something that people both want to do and a competitor, the competitor wants to have it happen too. So it, it you know, happens quite uh, easily and um, everyone's incentivized to do it and forcing the existing party. Uh, I, I realize it's more data portability than interoperability, but they are, they are related. You need some interoperability. So, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, it takes this sort of accumulated wisdom, almost like a common law of interoperability where you see the, uh, and I, the people, I think I think I would, you know, study all the cases of failed interoperability and successful before uh, mandating it for any success of any situation. That's my thinking. Lovely, thanks, Tim. So we've got uh, uh, one minute left, so time for uh, one more short question. Um, so you've, you talked a bit about explaining things to people and us being better as agencies uh, at uh, communicating, but are we doing enough to understand what people want? That is a, a great uh, question. Um, I feel that uh, in government, we are constantly, especially in the more technical sides of government, uh, constantly uh, in danger of sort of escaping from what people um, want and why, uh, you know, why they um, support government at all and the kind of things uh, uh, you know, they're looking for, for government uh, to, to do uh, for them. And, um, you know, it's, it's challenging because uh, the, the public uh, doesn't usually, you know, they don't come in with a sophisticated theory about um, you know, two-sided market analysis, but they do um, care, I would say, very much. Um, and I, you hear this about just how much of a sense of opportunity there is in the markets they are in particularly if you're talking about a small business, uh, how powerless they feel in, in, uh, in the face of certain uh, monopolists and just how uncomfortable they feel with, with private, and now this gets political, with private power um, being in a few uh, entities who are not accountable by voting or any other means. 
And I think um, it is incumbent on all of us to, you know, sort of translate those, um, those desires, which after all led to the enactment of the antitrust laws in the first place and try to follow them and um, see if we uh, can keep uh, ourselves uh, aligned with the, the democratic will. Because, um, you know, I think in the end, antitrust law or all laws, frankly, live and die um, on their connection to, to uh, the will of the people at some level. And I think we get in a great peril by wandering too far away from what, uh, what people uh, want, however expressed. Couldn't agree more on that. Um, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, we really appreciate you making the time, which you know is an incredibly busy time for you right now. And, uh, and certainly speaking on behalf of myself, all the audience in the room here and online, thank you very, very much. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. So uh, I'll, I'll ask the, the panelists to uh, come join us for the next panel. Um, and I'll, I'll, it's my pleasure to introduce Diane Coyle. Uh, so they'll, they'll filter in uh, whilst I'm uh, uh, introducing Diane. Um, the, uh, uh, again, this is another speaker who will be very well known to uh, most of our audience. She's the um, Bennett Professor of Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. And she uh, co-directs the Bennett Institute where she heads research on the themes of progress and productivity. Her latest book, which I'm sure she'll be happy for us to mention, yes, is Cogs you. and Monsters, uh, What Economics Is and What It Should Be. And it's really trying to focus on the future of uh, economics, so very germane to today's topic. She's ha had a whole number of uh, public roles, many of which you've heard of, but I'll particularly call out her um, sitting on the, the panel that has become you know, colloquial known as the, the Furman Report, uh, and she was one of the, the five experts on that. So over to you, Diane. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody in the room and online. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here today. I've uh, actually been looking at the digital economy for the past 25 years. And so um, I, it's been great for me that, as Benoit Coré pointed out in the previous session, the whole economy is the digital economy now. It's been fantastic. Um, particularly recently looking at data and the use of data by companies. So data is an economic asset of growing importance. And the recent research by economists underlines the productivity and profit benefits of using data effectively, which is helping frontier firms pull ever further ahead of their competitors. So as a productivity story, that's great for those companies, but there seem to be two costs associated with it. One is the increased concentration, and the other is the potential privacy costs, and obviously there's been a lot of debate about privacy. So privacy and competition, the theme of this panel, and not so long ago, these seemed like two unrelated areas of policy. And they converged in a way that raises lots of non-obvious questions. So to what ex extent are the policy aims in harmony or in conflict? Is the source of the problem that we are concerned about existing business models and therefore data practices of incumbent tech companies? Um, does that mean, if so, that antitrust is the right policy tool? and there have been proposals from the competition world, such as open data. Um, or in, alternatively, um, is uh, d different and tougher ex-ante regulation the right solution to whatever we think the problem is? Um, or on the other hand, is improved privacy protection a feature of competition in the market? So uh, we, can, we can rely on that. Uh, to what extent should we rely on informed consumer choice? Should individuals actually have to bear the burden of their own privacy protection, or is that just part of the time tax of modern online life? So um, to dig into these questions, we've got a fantastic panel. And um, I'm going in the order that was in the email that was sent to me a while ago. So it's probably entirely random as far as the panel is concerned. Um, but we're going to start with John Edwards as the Information Commissioner for the UK. And um, uh, so I'm going to ask the panel members to tackle whichever of those questions they, they fancy, and I might follow, in, follow up with some of my own, and then we'll have time for the audience questions online later. So, John, over to you. Well, thank you, Diane, um, and thanks to Andrea and the um, CMA for hosting this event. It's wonderful uh, and to be on a, um, a, such an auspicious panel, such a talented people is, is, is really um, amazing. It's going to illuminate this topic, I think. Um, you know, we've heard already uh, an incredible level of sophisticated economic analysis and discourse and really deep technological uh, understanding. Um, and I want to tell you, <coughs> that ends now. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I have been reflecting a little bit on um, 
this marketplace and, and how these regulatory roles come together. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, the streets of London were resonating with the music of Queen uh, as Queen performed in front of Buckingham Palace. Uh, I don't think they performed one of the most renowned numbers, which um, they gave to the soundtrack of a famous 1980s movie, um, Highlander. Uh, anybody seen that film? So Highlander um, is a story of a bunch of immortals roaming the world, uh, lopping each other's heads off, uh, <laughs> until, as Sean Connery says um, in one scene, in the end, there can be only one. Now, this um, became the business model of digital startups. Uh, and was dubbed, in fact, uh, the Highlander Principle in about 2009. There can be only one audio streaming service. There can be only one uh, social media platform. There can be only one ride share, one accommodation share, right? Uh, which has led, I think, to these extraordinarily dominant digital businesses. Now, my previous job, I was a privacy commissioner in New Zealand, a nation uh, of five million. We were takers of these technologies. And the problem there emerged quite quickly for me is that they are one and we are many. And in, in my initial thinking around this issue, uh, the we was we privacy commissioners, uh, data protection regulators around the world. Uh, we're just nipping at the heels and we need, if we're going to be effective, to join together and to cooperate. And more and more we're seeing that happen. And I'm really pleased with the, um, the work that we are doing with um, colleagues in Singapore. I had a meeting today about the artificial intelligence uh, um, audit tool that they have developed with the Federal Trade Commission. We've done a Clearview uh, AI investigation with the Privacy Commissioner in Australia, for example. Um, but the they are one and we are many problem, it seemed to me you know, quite quickly, is not just we are many around the world, it's that we are many domestically. There are many different regulators uh, regulating different parts of the elephant, if you like. Uh, and there are opportunities uh, for one to, for, for the, the, op, for the uh, market participants to play one off against the other uh, uh, to the detriment of the consumer public. Um, and it seemed to me that, you know, back at home, we need to be coordinating with content regulators, with privacy regulators, with competition regulators. So imagine my great joy and um, surprise when I arrived here in the United Kingdom to find that not only was this thinking more developed, it had actually materialised into an entity called the Digital Regulators Cooperation Forum. And that is so important, I think, in resolving some of the questions that have come up today, that we can present a united front uh, and a united uh, modus operandi. We can join the dots in the different disparate regulatory models to get good outcomes uh, for consumers. It's not without risks, um, but it's really essential that we, we walk really closely together so that we can, for example, examine some of the claims uh, that industry can't do this competition outcome because it might prejudice this data protection imperative or vice versa. Uh, we've seen, I think, some really positive developments in data protection through the likes of uh, Apple's uh, ad tracking transparency and Google's retirement of the third party uh, sandbox. Um, but, you know, th those are really positive consumer outcomes from a privacy perspective that could be looked at from a competition lens as perhaps self-preferencing. And the, and, the, and the merit, I think, the benefit of working so closely together as regulators is that we can ensure if there is self-preferencing -pre or if those issues do need to be examined, that they are examined uh, without prejudicing those positive privacy outcomes uh, for the consumer public. Similarly... I suspect Jane might talk about you know, the interoperability imperative that's being driven from Europe, because it was a big issue in DC a month or two ago when we were there. That you know, the, the, the security framework from some of the closed platforms is a really important feature uh, for privacy outcomes, as with end-to-end -end encryption. And if you drive interoperability in a way that compromises those, uh, those positive outcomes, then that has a net um, deficit for consumer safety. So we need to be able to examine those claims uh, and to do that in a way which um, is coordinated and joined up. Um, so I'll, I'll just pause there. Um, and you know, there, are, there are many other examples, I think, and, and lots more potential uh, for us to work together. But uh, there's, a, there's a saying um, uh, from back home uh, the, in the Maori language, which I will 
embarrass myself by having to read, but um, it's, it's a whakatoi, which is a, a proverb, and it is, nā tō roro, nā taku roro, ka ora te iwi. And this is, is often used when tribes come together, and they say, with your food basket and my food basket, all the people will thrive. And I think it's a nice way of encapsulating the imperative and the benefits of close cooperation between uh, regulators to achieve common goals for consumers in this area. Thank you. Thank you, John. Before I turn to Jane, can I just follow up and ask you to say a little bit more about international cooperation? Because it's hard enough among domestic regulators. How do you see it working across, uh, across borders? It, it, it is a challenge, but it's increasingly being seen as an imperative. I mean, there are a number of cooperation frameworks. The Global Privacy Assembly has an international enforcement cooperation uh, mechanism. Um, the APEC um, uh, has, a, uh, has an enforcement cooperation network as well. Uh, there are many bilateral opportunities for enforcement, and we see those. Um, we've seen those with WhatsApp with Ireland and Canada. We've seen Canada co cooperating with Australia. Um, so we are seeing those networks develop more and more. Th there are limitations, and the domestic. You know, each of us operates within a domestic framework. So I do think some of these conversations need to be elevated to state to state level. Uh, in order to provide a more timely and seamless regulatory environment. Yeah, and I think Timu's closing point about political consent is really important in that regard as well. Uh, let's move on. There'll be other questions later. Uh, we'll go to Jane next. Jane Horvath is Apple's Chief Privacy Officer. And um, Jane, I think you're going to talk about um, how you see competition on privacy working and how it benefits consumers. Sure. Thanks, Diane. And I want to thank the CMA for inviting me to speak to you all today. Uh, the discussion of privacy and the, con and the context of competition is necessary and it is critical that we get it right. At Apple, we believe privacy is a fundamental human right, which is why we design every product and feature from the ground up with privacy in mind. While privacy is a competitive differentiator, it is not the reason why we build privacy into everything that we do. We do it for our customers and because it's the right thing to do. Our teams work collaboratively across Apple, putting the same effort into privacy innovation as we put into all of our product designs. And the result is greater choice and superior products for our customers. And at Apple, privacy is truly a company-wide commitment and no single person or team is solely responsible for bringing it to life. Rather, at Apple, privacy is a cross-functional pursuit. This is true in everything that we do, but let me give you an example. One day, two engineers showed up at my door, and they were just standing there, and I said, hi, can I help you? And, um, and they, this, was, this was about eight years ago. And they said, we are gonna be creating a wearable. And we think that there's a lot of potential with this wearable for health information and health innovation. And we want to get it right. And we're just at the beginning, and we want to make sure that your team is embedded in that product from the beginning. And that product ended up becoming Apple Watch. And you know, as we were looking at building uh, Apple Watch and the health app, we were also looking about the potential innovation that can come from health data. So as we were looking at the guidelines that would guide app developers that wanted to call and work with this health data, we looked at it from how do we protect the consumers here, because this is very sensitive information, but give apps the ability to use this data. So in the App Store guidelines, if a developer wants to call the APIs for health data, they have to do so solely for the purposes of health and fitness. No secondary uses there, because that is the most privacy-friendly way. That is privacy by default. The same approach applies to advertising in our ecosystem. Back in 2011, when I joined Apple, developers were using a UDID, UDID, and had been since 2007. The UDID was a hardware identifier which they used to track users across the platform and to serve ads. A UDID offers users no choice as it is hard-coded into the device and it was bad for privacy. 
Recognizing the role that advertising plays in supporting a vibrant app ecosystem, we set out to design a more privacy-friendly approach. In examining the ecosystem, we determined that there were three identifiers that were necessary for effective <coughs> excuse me, advertising. Two identifiers, the app identifier and the vendor identifier, could be used for first-party advertising in the app or vendor ecosystem, respectively. The third, the IDFA, or identifier for advertising, was designed to allow apps to do third-party advertising. Each app on your device can call the same IDFA. <clears throat> the IDFA is used for track tracking. I'm so sorry, I've got something in my throat. In 2012, we launched those three identifiers and also included a limit ad tracking, or LAT switch in which users could ask apps not to track. By 2013, we recognized that apps were not abiding by this policy prompt, so we moved it to a technical control in which the LAT switch reset the IDFA. Again, we recognized this was not enough privacy protection, so in 2016, the LAT switch changed to technically reset the IDFA to all zeros. Um, however, we continue to hear from our customers. A good example of this is, uh, you know, dear Apple, is my phone listening to me? I was recently talking to my husband about a shoe that I'd looked at online and that I, you know, would want for a potential birthday gift. And suddenly that shoe is appearing on every app on my device. Surely the phone must be listening to me. No, in fact, what was happening was she probably looked at the shoe on an app and then that developer transferred that data to a third party ad network and those placements were made across other apps. And that is what we call tracking. So in 2021, we launched App Tracking Transparency or ATT. ATT is not anti-advertising. It just puts consumers in control of whether they are tracked or not. Any app that wants to track must call the ATT prompt, and only after that person agrees will the app be able to call the IDFA or to track. It is important to note that ATT does not impact first-party advertising. All apps may still freely do first-party advertising. Apple engages in limited advertising on our platform, but we do not track and we go further than our competitors. Apple does not use third-party data for advertising on its own apps. Apple actively prompts users to choose whether Apple can use first-party data to serve them personalized ads. No other first-party ad network does that. Even when serving personalized ads on its own apps, Apple does not allow for targeting of groups smaller than 5,000 users. Lost in the conversation about privacy's impact on the bottom line of advertisers and data brokers is the user. This is who we should be thinking of first, and that is how Apple approaches privacy. At Apple, we reject the idea that our users and their personal data are products for us to sell, but that view is exceedingly rare among other technology companies. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jane. Water to sit there. Um, so, obviously, for Apple, privacy is a dimension of competition. It's part of the effect of competition. But you'll be aware that many people say, no, it's what, what Apple has done is um, protecting the position of a powerful incumbent. So what's the kind of evidence that competition authorities should be looking at to uh, weigh up those competing views? Sure. Um, the App Store. In order for a developer to get on the App Store, a developer has to register. They have to agree to the App Store guidelines. I referred to those when I was talking about health and the additional privacy requirements in the guidelines. And they have to submit their app for app review. App review will first and foremost run the app to make sure that it actually runs and it do does what it says it's supposed to do. So a while back, there were a, a number of flashlight apps and app review detected that those flashlight apps were calling a lot of APIs that they really didn't, you know, why does a flashlight app need your location? So app review goes through and determines, are they minimizing the data that they need to operate? 
So um, App Review also is able to weed out malware. And this is, this is the data point that I think is very, very critical. The other competing platform does allow other apps to come onto the platform through what we call sideloading. But that platform has 98% more malware than iOS does. And that's a public number out there. So what I would just caution as we look at opening up the platform, we also have to make sure that we're not exposing consumers who have really gotten used to operating on a relatively safe platform to expose themselves to these kind of attacks. And then the other, and John referred to it, is as we look at interoperability, I know there was a question asked uh, of Tim Wu, um, we also just, one of the requirements is interoperability of even end-to-end -end encrypted systems. That is a risky endeavor. There are some, but more, much more limited people who think it's possible, but most think that that will come with some loss of security. Thanks very much. Um, we're going to turn now to Jonathan, the computer scientist on the panel, uh, Professor of Computer Science and Public Affairs at Princeton. And um, you're going to talk to us about some of these technical questions, I think, Jonathan, so far away. Thank you. Um, thank you, Diane, and uh, thank you to the CMA for convening so many uh, global leaders in competition policy, present self excluded, of course. Um, so I'd like to do my part to kick off uh, the panel discussion um, with the most academic of methods, um, uh, a conceptual taxonomy. Um, so I want to suggest seven ways in which privacy and competition are deeply intertwined. Uh, the first is that privacy problems can contribute to competition problems. Um, so an example is in the search engine market where uh, Google search processes a large volume of user search data and that may be a barrier to new market entrance. Uh, or in the e-commerce market, Amazon has allegedly used its large store of customer data uh, for competitive advantage in entering retail verticals. Uh, a second way in which competition and privacy can interact is that competition problems can contribute to privacy problems. So an example there is in the social, me uh, social network market. Um, Facebook, or I guess Meta as the cool kids call it now, is arguably a dominant incumbent. Um, uh, and that allows it to more comprehensively collect and leverage user data on its services. Or another example, uh, again, the search engine market, uh, or, or I'm sorry, the, the web browser market, uh, Google Chrome has a very significant market share, and that allows it to set de facto privacy norms on the web. A third way in which these two areas can interact is that privacy remedies can overlap with competition remedies. So data portability, transfer and interoperability uh, advance both privacy and competition goals. Uh, query how effective they are or could be. Uh, a fourth way in which privacy and competition interact is that competition remedies can create privacy problems. Um, so for example, uh, interoper interoperability proposals have led to concerns about end-to-end -end encryption, as Jane just noted. Um, and alternative app stores and side-loaded apps have led to concerns about protecting user data, also, as, as Jane noted. Um, a fifth way in which privacy and competition can interact is that privacy remedies can create or exacerbate competition problems. So an example there is in the display advertising market. Um, Google recently proposed a topics API, um, which could potentially entrench Google as a dominant firm because of the technical design of the API, um, where it rewar rewards reach across the web um, and having access to other sources of browsing data. Another example is comprehensive privacy regulation, like GDPR, where um, some critics have been concerned that it may disproportionately be burdensome for market entrants and disproportionately be easier to comply with for large incumbents. Uh, the sixth way in which privacy and competition might interact is um, that choice architecture problems, often termed dark patterns, uh, pervade both privacy and competition policy. Um, ultimately, if there's a willing consumer who consents to a particular data flow, or a particular transaction, law pretty rarely stands in the way of that. Uh, and so that leads to immense problems about the structure of user choices. Um, in privacy, examples include uh, cookie consent banners with asymmetric choices, or buried account privacy settings that are rarely understood by users, or sometimes even a company's own employees. On the positive side, Apple's app tracking transparency. Uh, and in the competition landscape, examples include defaults and self-preferencing. Okay, the, uh, the last area I want to touch on um, is uh, how new privacy models, especially on the open web, um, can enable platform oversight and accountability. Uh, and that includes for competition problems. 
Um, so traditional research methods for understanding online services like interviews and surveys and web crawls are really essential for scrutinizing platforms. Um, but those methods also have some very significant limitations. Uh, interviews and surveys rely on self-reported recollections, for example. Uh, and web crawls might not be reflective of real user activity. Um, understanding what users actually experience with online services and the actions they take in the context of those services is especially important um, uh, for, the mar for the large platforms because they're so individualized. Uh, that's through content personalization, ad targeting, and a user's own decisions about what queries to run or who to follow on a social network. Um, there are some important legislative initiatives moving forward, like the DSA in Europe, um, that are a promising path toward researcher access to platform data, um, though, though of unclear scope of access and, and of timeline at present. Um, so new privacy models are an important complement. If users can contribute their data uh, for platform accountability purposes to academic research groups or to trusted nonprofits, um, uh, that will enable new quantitative insights about the effects of specific business practices and the efficacy of specific market interventions. Um, so one example of this is uh, the Markup Citizen Browser, which studies Facebook recommendations by uh, uh, sourcing data from real Facebook users. Um, another is uh, NYU's Ad Observatory, which collects Facebook ads. And where I'll leave things is um, a pair of projects that my group at Princeton has been developing for a little over two years called Rally and Web Science. And the idea is to democratize this kind of platform accountability research. Um, uh, these tools, which, which we've been developing with Mozilla, are already in use by teams at the Markup in Stanford and Columbia. And they're being used to understand issues like information integrity and competition and privacy. And we can answer questions like, you know, what are the effects of a specific platform self-preferencing practice? Um, uh, uh, how would users respond if regulation prohibited a specific practice? Um, what are the effects of a certain default? Uh, what are the effects of choice ballot remedies, which the EU has used in some instances? So we can answer very specific competition policy questions in, uh, in, with rigorous quantitative research. And I think that's, that's ultimately what's most exciting about this direction, um, that we can use these new privacy models for platform accountability to advance data-driven competition policy. And legislators and regulators like the CMA will be equipped with better evidence uh, about the market effects of anti-competitive practices and can better predict how interventions they might require uh, would improve those practices. Thank you. That, that's fascinating. Um, you talked about academics using these tools. Um, what do you want competition authorities like the CMA to do? Um, well, uh, for starters, events like these and the, abil you know, the ability to engage one-on-one -on -one are, are really invaluable. I think in the near term, um, it is probably unrealistic for uh, uh, competition authorities to um, uh, run this particular type of study themselves. Um, you know, it involves handling data from individual users and uh, putting government agencies in that position um, uh, brings with it a, a, a whole bunch of considerations that are different from academics conducting that, that kind of study. So I think academics feeding into government agencies uh, with this type of research uh, is important. I also think there are kinds of studies that don't have the privacy sensitivities um, uh, that this kind of study does. So you could imagine, for example, um, regulators using web crawls or uh, more ordinary and widely accepted survey methods um, uh, that uh, pair up nicely with these uh, methods that involve sourcing data about uh, online activity directly from users. Uh, the questions are flooding in, so please keep them coming. Um, but our final speaker is going to be Damien Gerardin um, of Gerardin Partners, um, talking about um, uh, the app developers and um, the implementation of privacy measures on, on them. So Damien, over to you. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you very much, uh, Diane, and thank you to, to the CMA and in particular Stefan for putting together this, this great uh, conference. Uh, uh, as you alluded to in the interest of full disclosure, I, I represent a number of app developers, some of which have uh, issues with Apple and Google. I would like to focus my short presentation on the, on the tension between, on the one hand, the need for platform operators uh, to adopt and enforce rules to ensure the quality of their platform, uh, and on the other hand, the risk that these rules and enforcement uh, are used by the platforms to engage in self-preferencing and other distortions of competition. 
This tension is addressed in the recently issued final report of the CMA's market study on mobile ecosystems, which is, by the way, an excellent piece of work. Um, um, I, I really commend the CMA for um, uh, drafting it. And it also shows that if you, if you have the right team and the right skills, you can do a lot in one year. Very often it's said that you know, competition authorities are very slow. In this case, I'm impressed by what they managed to do in a single year. While this tension can be found with respect to all digital platforms, I will, however, focus essentially on mobile ecosystems because this, is, uh, this allows me actually to, to draw from uh, the market study of the CMA. Um, this panel focuses on, on privacy, but I would like also to include security because very often privacy and security are um, arguments that are made together in order to justify the status quo uh, and resist regulatory intervention even when needed. I think this topic is particularly well suited to this event because um, this relationship between privacy and, and, and security arguments on the one hand and pro-competitive intervention on the other hand uh, requires evidence-based, data-driven decision-making by regulators. So I'm sorry I'm going to pick a little on, on Apple, uh, uh, even though uh, my neighbor is actually uh, working for, for Apple. Uh, but, but Apple is very much actually the focus of this uh, um, market study when it comes to privacy and security as justifications for the, the status quo. In, in the context uh, of, of, the, of the market study, the CMA accepts that platform governance is essential and brings benefits for consumers. That's actually true. Um, if you're a platform, you need to protect the quality of the platform. You need to have rules and enforce the rules because if your platform is infested by scammers, consumers will actually leave the platform. So you need to have rules and enforce them. At the same time, the CMA rightly stresses there are clear risks that this rule setting and oversight role oversteps the mark. And I will cite one bit of the market study which says, where private companies such as Apple and Google adopt a quasi-regulatory role, for example in relation to data protection law, there are risks that these companies face conflict of interest, as their own profit-driven incentives may not always be fully aligned with those of their users. I think that's an important point. So, I think that one of the great value of the market study is that it relies on technical evidence and technical expertise. Uh, a report was commissioned from a tech consultancy, uh, there was also expert advice from uh, a university professor. I think this is really what you want to do. I think that the uh, market study um, um, repudiates the narrative, which I'm afraid is often pushed by Apple, whereby there is a binary choice and an avoidable trade-off between enabling greater competition and protecting user privacy, security, and safety. My view is that these are not mutually exclusive objectives. And the evidence is this in the CMA report clearly shows it is possible to increase competition while preserving user privacy, security, and safety. I often hear that privacy is a human right. It is, and it is very important, but the right to property is also a human right, but it doesn't mean that you can use your property to distort competition. I think that these rights must be and are actually compatible with a competitive market framework. So if you look at the market study, it is quite skeptical about the privacy and security arguments Apple has raised to justify restrictions in app distribution, restrictions in browser engines, restrictions in cloud gaming, and restrictions in accessing NFC, the NFC chip. So I don't have to go 
the time to go into, do into the details, but I would also say that competition policy and competition authorities have been historically skeptical about regulatory vigilantism. If you take cases like Hilti and Tetra Pak, already at the time, the Commission decided, yes, safety is important, but and security is important, but they are competition authorities to, uh, sorry, they're authorities to enforce rules. And personally, as a citizen, I find more comfort in having uh, uh, public authorities enforcing uh, privacy rules and security rules rather than private actors. I see that my time is up. Um, what I would like to say uh, um, uh, to end is that I, I think going forward, one of the fundamental role of regulators will be to be in a position to distinguish between legitimate privacy and security claims and those that are pretextual or simply exaggerated. And that needs to be done on the basis of uh, uh, evidence and data. And this is why I'm so happy that, that uh, uh, this conference has been put together. I fear very much that gate gatekeepers will try to derail the DMA and the DMU regime by invoking uh, excuses uh, that are not legitimate. And I think that with the uh, um, market study uh, on mobile ecosystem, the CMA has taken the lead um, and set an important precedent for regulators across the world. I think regulators need to be equipped to be in a position to scrutinize and take evidence-based decision over the legitimacy and privacy and security, uh, of, sorry, legitimacy of privacy and security justifications. Thank you, Damien. Just a quick follow-up. Um, very easy to call for the public sector, the regulators, to do the regulating. Do you have any views on which regulators and how? because that's quite a challenge given the technical expertise in, in the companies themselves. Well, I think, you know, once again, the, the CMA and the ICO um, have shown that they're capable to deal with these issues, especially, and I, I re really like your point, John, uh, because they collaborate together. I, mean, I think, you know, this, this, this sort of uh, collaboration between the different regulators active in the digital space is the way to go. Uh, we heard also from the first panel today that, you know, it made sense for competition authorities to share resources and share processes uh, because, of course, you know, you can only have so many data scientists and you will have always fewer data scientists than those uh, uh, of the gatekeepers. So I think there's a lot of expertise that need to be built, but um, I, I, I think that is, that is definitely uh, possible and I, I'm very encouraged uh, by the steps that have been taken by some authorities, in particular the CMA, but also the French competition authorities, and I think others will, will follow. In the meantime, probably sharing and collaborating within, within states, uh, um, and that is true for the UK, that is true in France, is, is definitely a, a way to go. So I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic and maybe I'm, I'm you know, unique in that way in, in believing that regulators are capable to do the job. I'm, I'm very much hostile to the view that regulators are incapable and it's better to leave it in the market because these people don't know what they're talking about. I don't think it's true, but you need capacity building. Thank you. And uh, now I think I'm going to give Jane the opportunity to respond to some of that, but also a particular question that's come in um, that I think is relevant to this discussion. I'm going to read it out. It's quite long. Some developments that purport to improve privacy may in fact weaken it, either by undermining cybersecurity or driving centralization of internet infrastructure. For example, the drive for end-to-end -end encryption can lead to applications that bypass enterprise and consumer security software, and developments like Apple's private relay service could hand control of a significant percentage of internet traffic to one dominant market participant. So, um, Jane, I'd let you sure. respond first, and then maybe sure. others want to pick up on that question as well. So, uh, first to address private relay, we don't collect any data. The whole point of private relay is so no one gets access to the IP address 
So that is just patently false that it's handing any power to us. Actually, what we're doing is we're empowering the user to protect themselves from tracking, particularly when they're on guest Wi-Fi networks. Um, and with respect to the CMA report, we're looking at it. Uh, there are a number of things that we disagree, and we are very, very happy to continue to engage with the CMA. I'm 100% focused on privacy. I feel like I know uh, privacy at Apple like I know my own home. I've been doing it for 11 years, and I've been involved in most of the development of every product that touches personal data. So we would be very happy to engage with you and with John uh, to talk about uh, the controls that are in place, the benefits of the App Store, and, and a lot of that. Thank you. John. Diane, yeah. thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation, Damien. I, I think um, it was very provocative, uh, and I think that we need that provocation. Um, and the ICO hasn't made, uh, formed an official position on this, so I, I could be going out on a limb here, and I, I sense people cringing behind their browsers at home. Um, <laughs> but... Um, you know, we, in an ideal world, maybe what you propose would be, would be good, but we don't have the capacity for ex ante examination, I think, of every technology which is released or every app which is released. And, and, I, and so to that extent, if, if Apple is prepared to perform a kind of screening function or at least a, a filtering function to keep out the bad actors... Um, and as long as the, 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 those settings are at a genuine, you know, generally accepted point of compliance, I think that is a service. Um, I mean, Jane, how many, is it a public figure, how many apps are available through the App Store? I think we just released a report on the amount of malware and fraud we have uh, kept off the platform through App Review. And, you know, I would just, to, to add to that, I mean, I think we need to be accountable for the decisions that we make, absolutely accountable for any allegations of self-dealing. But um, I think the idea that by opening up the platform, that's going to be the cure-all to everything, I really think, and, and I'll defer to Jonathan to talk a little bit about some of the security concerns that was listed in, I think, your number five. I would have to go back and look. Yes. <laughs> but me... If, if, I'm, if I may, I mean, I mean, I'm not suggesting that regulators should examine everything ex ante. That's, that's not what I said, not at all. What I'm saying is that, let me give you an example. I think Jane mentioned the, the ATT framework. Um, it's, it's a significant shift, right? It, like the privacy sandbox in the case of, of Google. And it has significant consequences. So in those cases, I think, I mean, I, I, and, and the CMA did it with the privacy sandbox in, in a swift manner, an effective one, I would tend to believe. I think it's important for regulators to have a look, right? Because these sort of decisions can really interfere with competition and can actually mean that some companies may be wiped out. Right? Uh, I, I mean, you know, if some, I mean, there are some companies that people would be pleased to see wiped out. I'm not mentioning one. But, you know, but, but, but at the same time, you know, when some decisions are consequential, I think that going to the regulator and, uh, um, you know, asking the regulator to look into it, and if you don't do it, you know, others will ask the regulator to do it is, I think, is, is meaningful. So what I'm saying is that I think we all agree that privacy and security are important. The point I'm, I'm, I'm raising is that the ideal solution is to find a way to ensure both privacy and security and competition. And most of the times, I tend to believe that it's possible. In fact, there may be scenarios where more competition can trigger more security and more, um, you, you know, more privacy because when you compete, you know, that can become a factor of competition and then can also, you know, stimulate, stimulate innovation. The only thing I'm skeptical about is that, oh, it's privacy, oh, it's security. Oh, no, no, we should not allow, we should not permit, we should not look into this. That's bad, you know, the world as we know it will collapse. I don't believe it's the case and I think that those competitors competition authorities have, who, which have looked into the matter, tend to 
agree. Now, to the extent you step in as a regulator, it has to be done on an objective basis with the proper evidence and the proper expertise. Now, are we in danger of agreeing vigorously? Um, uh, this, the Echo, Mobile Ecosystems final report um, uh, called for um, a three-way dialogue um, with the uh, companies and the regulate the CMA and the ICO. Are we all agreeing, does the panel agree, that this kind of voluntary cooperative model is, is the way to go, or, or are we still disagreeing about that? Ab absolutely. And uh, just to go back to ATT, the Keneal actually issued a finding with respect to ATT and how the Keneal is the French data protection regulator and how it was consistent with GDPR and it protected consumers and gave consumers the ability to make choices about tracking. Jonathan wants to come in. Would it be helpful, perhaps, if I gave a little bit of a technical sketch of some of the concepts we've been kicking around here? It really would. Okay. <laughs> so um, let me try to zip through uh, the specific topics that have come up. Um, so uh, with respect to the question about private relay and Jane's observation that Apple doesn't possess IP addresses, um, private relay um, works by directing certain network traffic to um, uh, servers that are controlled not only by Apple. So it bounces your traffic through servers, some of which are controlled by Apple, some of which are not controlled by tra uh, Apple. And as a result, there is no entity that is in a position to associate your network activity with uh, your identity. Um, for those who are familiar with Tor, this is a, it's an open source offering that does something similar. This is sort of like Apple's version of Tor. I don't know if that's in your marketing materials, but. Um, okay, so that, that's why. Um, no. Uh, gee, I wonder why. Um, okay, so um, uh, that, that's why Apple's not in a position to you know, take commercial advantage of that data. Um, uh, with respect to the question about end-to-end -end encryption or encryption in general and security scanning at the network level, um, this is an argument I saw quite often when I was at the FCC in the United States. Um, not coincidentally, it tended to come from internet service providers who were really interested in scanning customer network data for advertising purposes. Um, and um, from a technical perspective, it is, um, I'm not sure if I'm getting the local terminology right, poppycock. Um, the, um, uh, the sort of technically right way to do security scanning, if you have a user device you're really concerned about, is to use the wide range of off-the-shelf available tools that um, can reside on the device and uh, monitor for security issues. Tons and tons of services in this space. You'll get way better perspective than you ever would just watching at the network level. Um, um, and so um, you know, that particular argument, at least to my technical analysis, does not hold water. Um, on the issue of um, side-loading apps for alternative app stores and security, uh, here I will uh, respectfully part ways with Jane. Um, there are some technical options for Apple to keep a, ha a, a sort of hand on that market um, while allowing folks to distribute outside of the app store. They do something similar on Mac OS. Obviously, the platforms are not analogous, but the rough idea is you could have an app that gets scanned by Apple but isn't distributed by Apple, or is otherwise reviewed by Apple, but again, not distributed by Apple. Um, okay, and then last on the issue of end-to-end -end encryption and competition, um, through interoperability, uh, I just wanted to note that there are a bunch of different policy proposals out there, and how concerning they are for end-to-end -end encryption really depends on the proposal. Um, if you're talking about sort of fully open sourcing every aspect of a protocol, and then everything has to be able to plug into that, that's a massive burden. It's going to lock in some protocols that sometimes have not made the best decisions over time, um, and that's really problematic. On the other hand, if you say something like, Apple has to release a software development kit for interoperating with, what, uh, with iMessage. And you know, they don't have to tell us exactly how it works, just if you call the right API, you send an iMessage message, um, and they update the, the uh, kit periodically, you have to stay up to date. That is a very different proposal, um, and could potentially be a tremendous win for consumers. In fact, one of the most insecure messaging systems out there is also one of the most popular messaging systems out there, text messaging horribly insecure. <laughs> if everyone were using iMessage, I'm going to say something nice about Apple now. If everyone were, say, if everyone were using iMessage, that would be a huge win for security. Um, and so competition may actually advantage security in that respect. Hmm. I've blathered on a lot, so I'm going to stop. This is, this is exactly why we have technologists in the room. We had yes. uh, Derek McCauley yeah. on the Furman panel. He used slightly stronger language than Poppycock, I have. Yeah, sure. Okay. On, on, your, on your question, Diane, um, um, about the collaborative approach, um, I, collaboration is always good but we shouldn't be naive. 
right? Um, e okay, so you've got the DMA, you've got the DMU regime, there will be some market investigations. It will not go smoothly. I, I've been very much involved in, in the DMA debates. I, I spend a lot of my time, you know, thinking, writing about it and, and supporting it. Uh, and I've seen studies commissioned by gatekeepers that were truly mind-boggling. And I think some economists have lost their reputation in producing these studies. I think also that the DMA will trigger litigation. Designation will trigger litigation. The DMU regime, tons of litigation. So I like the idea of collaborative, yeah, you know, I'm looking forward to work with you, let's meet later to discuss. Sure, very nice, but in practice, this will be a brutal battle. I'm, I'm betting on it. And yeah, if things can be done in a nice and smooth manner, I love it. But my prediction and, you know, uh, there will be another conference in two years. And in the meantime, other events is that this will be very, very challenging. If you look at the rules in the DMA about the App Store, each and every of them will be challenged. There will be resistance to implement. And I think it's legitimate in a way to, you know, if you disagree with a regulation, to, to challenge it and to, you know, push your viewpoint. At the same time, I think there comes a moment where you need to implement and uh, we're not there yet. Diane, can I just mm. add my two cents? Mm. Thanks. Uh, I mean, I think co collaboration is really important. I think um, uh, regulators need to understand the markets that they are regulating, and that involves a dialogue and a discussion. Um, it sometimes involves getting quite close to an understanding. Uh, and, and we've launched, for example, at the ICO, the, 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 the regulatory sandbox. So we can actually explore uh, the regulatory implications of uh, an innovative application. We've done this in collaboration with the CMA, for example. And with the CMA, we've put out a joint statement on ad tech, for example. But I, I don't think that happens at the cost uh, of more interventionist regulation, because we always retain the regulatory tools to examine uh, an initiative ex post uh, and to bring the, the, the sort of regulatory tools, the, the fines and the uh, enforcement notices and the like, if we find on that um, ex post analysis that they are breaching those rules. So those things operate in tension, um, but I think um, we can be very effective working upstream and helping organisations to ensure they understand their obligations and are meeting them, uh, but also downstream, identifying non-compliant behaviour and um, punishing it and sending signals out into the, into the wider uh, economy. John, can I ask you the obverse of the question I put to Jonathan, which is about how should the regulators be using academic tools of this kind or working with academics? Well, I think uh, academics have an enormous amount to contribute in this area. Um, they are, I'm trying to think, disinterested, not uninterested, isn't it? Disinterested uh, observers uh, and sources of um, expert and contestable um, technical input, and we really, uh, we really need that. And uh, the other great advantage, of course, is that um, they don't cost very much. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> we have a, <laughs> you, know, you know, some of these skills. Fee fees have just gone up at this <laughs> end of the world. <laughs> the, 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 you know, these, it's an enormously competitive market for some of these skills, and it's difficult to retain uh, that capacity uh, within a regulatory um, framework. We have, I think, 80 in our um, tech team, um, but, you know, we, th there are very specific skills that... Um, uh, it, it's important that we access from uh, academia and that we're keeping across the kind of literature that um, people like Jonathan are producing. There's another question coming in specifically for you, John. Um, with the CMA uh, stepping up its focus on these technological skills, do you see the role of the um, ICA, ICO changing at all? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I think that um, we need to be more agile and responsive uh, to uh, these very fast developing uh, industries. Um, and I'm not sure, and I think the previous panel touched on this point, that when you come to analyse um, the, uh, the economic parameters of a, of a particular market, you're, 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 you're already 10 years behind in your modelling. Uh, and I think we have the same risk in the world of data protection. So I think that we need to be able to stand up multidisciplinary teams, dispatch them, uh, identify any, uh, any challenges to the, to the regulation, 
uh, drive some regulatory stakes into the ground to give certainty to other market participants, but we need to be able to act on that far more quickly than we've been able to. I'm not just talking about um, in the UK, but internationally, we need to be able to do that with more fleet of foot and, and greater agility. If I could follow yep. up on that very briefly, do. and the prior question about um, sort of discussion-based approaches to these issues. Um, I lost several years of my life to a standards process that, that was attempting a discussions-based approach to addressing web privacy um, through an organization called uh, W3C. It was trying to set standards for hmm. this thing called Do Not Track that mm -hmm. keeps coming back with different names. At any rate, um, I think it's important to understand when regulators choose a discussion strategy and an engagement strategy that the process of the discussion and engagement can itself advantage certain companies and disadvantage others. It was very clearly a strategy in the W3C process for advertising firms to drag it out as long as possible. And um, you know, I think there's some evidence of that um, in engaging with competition and privacy regulators more recently. Uh, an example of that, um, uh, just to put another company on the hot seat, is I think the interactions over Google's privacy sandbox are a little head scratching from a technical perspective. Um, um, you know, the notion that like, it is desirable that the major web browser, the most popular web browser in the world retain allowing tracking by default as the status quo while we figure out what we want to do with web tracking is a little puzzling when every other major web browser disables tracking to some extent by mm -hmm. default. Um, and so I just want to really highlight that that is a dimension of negotiating with regulators that is important to keep in mind. We've only got a few minutes left. I'd like to um, uh, ask each panel member to address an issue that we haven't talked about so far, and it's the other party in the room, and that's the consumers. And I think um, you know, Tim Wu raised this in his uh, contribution, but we're talking about choice ar architecture, privacy where people might have very strong feelings or different feelings about it. So um, I think the question on which you might end and anything else you want to end with is um, how do we take account, actually, of what consumers want in this domain and how best to protect them, when, as we heard, it's actually very technical and complicated and, and difficult. So I'm going to go in reverse order. Uh, that means I'm picking on you, you first, Damien. Yeah, so um, um, I, I, I think that um, this, if, you, if you think about consumers, you know, it's, it's sometimes difficult indeed to see what consumers want, right? So take the issue of privacy. I'm, I'm sure that if you ask people whether they care about privacy, they will say, we do care about, about privacy, although their behavior suggests the opposite, right, in, in, in many ways. So if you take, for example, the title of this panel, uh, Privacy First, I would tend to see, yes, privacy absolutely, and security absolutely, but there are other things as well, right? You know, you know, I want a web which is private, but which is diverse with a lot of, with a lot of content. However it is, it is actually funded. Uh, I want a web that is competitive. So, for example, there is this idea now that, you know, uh, uh, production of content with an adverse, uh, advertising business model is absolutely terrible. Right, and any any sort of data, you know, tracking or sharing is is an absolute nightmare. Well, I, and I'm definitely not pitching for Google. <laughs> Those who know me, I've got several complaints and and cases against them. It seems to me that it's slightly excessive, right? I mean, we cannot all shift to a subscription business model, right? a lot of the content on the internet is funded through advertising. And of course, if I want to have, so don't worry about my glasses, if you want to have, you know, if, if I want to buy 10, if I want to, to buy 10 subscriptions, you know, for me and my children, I can. I've got the money to do that. But most people can only buy one, if at all, right? So I think that we need to think a little bit more broadly rather than focusing only on competition only on privacy. I think consumers want different things, and we should try to combine them and find a balance between these different priorities. Jonathan. Um, so uh, you, you've touched on exactly the hard science question here. How do you combine um, uh, what folks say they want in interviews and surveys with what they actually do, behavioral data? Um, now, I would 
rather significantly take issue with the suggestion that what consumers do with respect to privacy is indicative of what their preferences are. There's, in fact, a wealth of academic research about that very issue. It's sometimes dubbed the privacy paradox. Um, hmm. You know, why do people say they care so much about privacy but then don't act like they care about privacy? Well, it turns out, you know, you shouldn't get a PhD in computer science to understand how to configure your social media settings. Um, um, and to give an example of this, actually, from Apple's... A, br uh, a brief example, because we're running over time. Indeed. Okay, very quick example. App tracking transparency. I'm going to say something that is nice, but maybe backhanded. Um, not <laughs> is not actually technical innovation. Uh, what was new about app tracking transparency was flipping a default and presenting the user with a pop-up. Right? It was a change to the choice architecture, and it radically changed how privacy works in iOS. Right? So that has nothing to do with user preferences and everything to do with choice. So I'll close by saying I have a PhD student who is doing wonderful work looking at user behavior and preferences with respect to competition issues. And if you're watching, good luck with your dissertation. <laughs> Jane. And I will quickly say my remarks that I gave earlier, I, I hope you took away that everything that we do is focused on the consumer. And as Jonathan said, ATT, and as I explained, was an evolution. And it was an evolution that was a change in advertising practices on the platform in response to consumers. We get consumer questions, complaints every day, and we are focused clearly on our users and consumers and consumer trust, because if they don't trust us, they won't use our platform. And John, you get the final word. Thank you. Well, uh, I, I don't think that people are saying um, that they want one thing or the other. Sure, people want free stuff. Uh, people need to understand that, that comes at a cost. Hmm. Uh, that the free stuff they want is funded by advertising. Uh, but as Jonathan alluded to, so much of the, um, the so-called choice and transparency is driven by dark patterns that favour um, the, uh, the, the, the revenue gatherer. Uh, and what we need to move towards is a more transparent uh, and effective choice mechanism, which we do not have. Transparency without an effective ability to make choices isn't worth anything. I looked at the New Yorker website, you know, had to use as the TCF framework. Mm. There was about 450 vendors. That's transparency, but it's useless transparency to me. I can do nothing with that information. So where we need to be moving, I think, is to really be making, uh, giving people the tools to make effective choices and exercise control over their data while getting the benefits uh, of the uh, innovations that the uh, digital industries produce. This debate is going to run and run. You've been a fantastic panel. Thank you very much. Please let me join me in thanking them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. That really was a magnificent panel. Uh, very uh, articulate and thoughtful uh, panelists, a magnificent chair. Uh, we've now got a break online. You'll see when we're coming back. It's around 20 minutes or so. So uh, cue to a coffee break.
Hello everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon uh, to all of us uh, here in the room and to those people online. I hope you've been enjoying the uh, conference so far. Um, we're moving to the final session of today and we're going to be building on uh, Bill's keynote and the heads of agencies discussion to really get into what are these data and technology units doing, uh, how are we collaborating with our colleagues uh, and what the, uh, what the impact is. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we published a paper yesterday um, that I wrote uh, and what I'm going to do for the next 20 minutes or so is take you uh, at a high level through uh, some of that paper, but that you should still read it anyway. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be joined uh, in 20 minutes or so by six very esteemed colleagues uh, from uh, six other agencies who are basically doing a, a role very similar to mine and we'll be able to give you the real international perspective. So uh, without further ado, um, the uh, I'm going to talk about the technology-led transformation of competition and consumer agencies focusing on the CMA. Um, uh, I use the term technology-led transformation. What, why would I use uh, perhaps a slightly convoluted term? Uh, the reason is there's a lot of discussion uh, in the private sector in particular about digital transformation. So this is the use of uh, a variety of different technologies to really try and make sure that the operations of firms are more efficient or to build new tools and capabilities for organisation. And that's great. We absolutely do need that as agencies. But we need to be doing more as well. Uh, as uh, we'll be very, you'll all be very well aware, and we've seen a lot today, that we're dealing with a lot of challenges in uh, digital markets uh, ourselves. And uh, here's a, a few logos for things I'm going to talk about as I come further into the talk. And in order to deal effectively with these kind of issues, we need to make sure that we really understand technology and the underlying skills for digital uh, transformation and for understanding um, challenges in markets. A lot of them are going to be very similar. So uh, in the next uh, uh, 20 minutes or so, I'm going to try and cover five things. So a couple of slides on forming the data team. Uh, the real focus of the discussion is really going to be on casework, uh, but I'm also going to have a couple of e extra sessions on building technology uh, and developing techniques before some final reflections. Um, in terms of the, the unit, uh, 
the uh, it started almost five years ago uh, when the uh, the board decided to set up uh, the data unit, as Andrea talked about earlier. Uh, I joined uh, almost four years ago, uh, and then we started getting the first data scientists and engineers in the beginning of 2019. We started expanding that out into behavioral science and technology insight the following year. Um, through mostly organic growth, uh, we've grown to almost 50 people. So it's uh, you know still quite a lot smaller than uh, our legal service or economics, as it as I think is fine, but we're actually a, a relatively significant size. <laughs> I, I'm happier for my job that we're not too big. Uh, the, so what I'm going to do today is the five different roles that we play within the organization. So the first is providing expert data and technology advice. Um, there's a variety of different forms this can take, but when we're trying to look thematically, one we're, thing we're finding across lots of our different cases that we're helping a lot uh, in uh, understanding firms' algorithms, and increasingly, and this is sort of a or almost a more recent theme, we're really trying to make sure that we have to get our heads around privacy and hunting technologies. Secondly, there's a lot we're doing around data acquisition and data science. So one might be in the context of bespoke um, uh, requests for information to firms and dealing with very large data sets from firms. Another one might be, and we spent a lot of time on this, building our own uh, scraping and monitoring capabilities. And thirdly, we're actually building data pipelines as well. Um, we're then going to talk about data-driven tool development. So this is really us building our own software uh, to enable a variety of different things. Um, we've mentioned, you've heard behavioral science actually a number of times already. So we're going to talk about behavioral science. And lastly, a whole variety of different kind of research type capabilities from doing um, things that are more like academic research through to horizon scanning and really trying to plug these into the uh, pipeline of cases for the uh, CMA. So to the first case example. So this is a consumer protection case on fake and misleading online reviews. Uh, and we started working on this right from the, uh, right the get-go, as the Americans say, uh, from early 2019 when the first data scientists and engineers uh, first came in. Uh, and the initial role we had was working with our consumer protection colleagues in a sort of uh, integrated team. We were um, directly interfacing with Facebook and eBay, and they were making commitments on what they were going to be doing to uh, reduce the, or really try to you know, completely remove the trading of fake and uh, uh, misleading online reviews on their platforms. Um, and uh, it turns out they're going to do that through algorithms, as you'd expect. And there were particular timelines that they were setting out for how they were going to be able to do things. And we really needed technology expertise in order to assess what they said they were going to do and the timelines in which they said they were going to be able to do it and, and challenge when needed. We then moved into a sort of second phase uh, and there's a couple of different elements of this second phase. Uh, and we're really trying to focus on uh, platforms that have online reviews on them and trying to look at what those platforms are doing to deal with this problem with fake and misleading online reviews. And one of the, um, the first things we had to determine was which platforms would we take forward for uh, investigations. And we, uh, we built a, a variety of different scraping capabilities, as I was just mentioning, and we, uh, we then tried to assess how bad did we think the problems were in terms of fake and misleading online reviews. Uh, and uh, we also, at the same time, really wanted to build up our own capability for understanding the various um, techniques available so that we could, in, uh, in uh, due course, make sure that we could assess firms' capability. So uh, this picture here on the screen is actually uh, from... Uh, it's actually some real data. Uh, and uh, in particular, we've got a firm in the center. This is the red dot. This firm was told to our uh, consumer team, there was a complaint that they'd been uh, using fake reviews. Um, what we did uh, there after that, we looked at all the green dots. The green dots are reviewers of this particular firm. And then the yellow dots are other firms that those reviewers have then gone on to look at. Um, the, what you can see here is you can see a, a group of green dots. This is a group of individuals who have all been reviewing exactly the same firms. Uh, but let's, we start to look into those firms and we can see that one is a Korean antiques firm. One is a US asphalt firm. Uh, and other things that are completely non-related. And we see the same set of reviewers reviewing these you know, globally different companies. Obviously, this is highly suspicious. Now, what's particularly interesting is we... You know, my team actually didn't invent this particular technique for looking for fake reviews. In fact, the consumer team already did it, but they were doing it manually, uh, recording things in an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, 
hired a, uh, a data engineer. Uh, literally his first day on the job, he was able to create code that scraped things, and he was able to produce a first version of this chart off his own back on his first afternoon on the job. And of course, once you've got it in code, you can, you can scale it 100 times, 1,000 times, 100,000 times if you need. And right now, we're working very closely with our consumer colleagues uh, on this investigation, and we really get it We've had some significant data requests. We're also getting in a detailed way into the automated processing system, the algorithms of the firms. To move to another example, also from the relative early days of the data unit, was focusing on the digital advertising market study, which had a particular focus on Google and Facebook. So that's search advertising and display advertising, respectively. Within search advertising, we really wanted to understand the nature of Google's uh, scale advantage in search. And we devised a particular piece of analysis analysis where we uh, went to Google and Bing, we got one week of all searches uh, in the UK. Um, now, turns out searches are, have a lot of personal information in them, so we to deal with privacy issues, we needed to hash um, the, the text so that we couldn't read it. But we use the same hash for the two firms, so we can actually match and try and see if whether they have the exact same searches or not. Um, this is the results of what we found. So, uh, on the uh, left-hand side of the chart, these are the most frequent searches on Google and Bing. As we move to the right-hand side, we get much less frequent searches, and these are the bottom 30% we label as tail queries. These are less frequent searches. And we can see the red line is the percentage of Google's exact search terms that Bing sees. And if we can move into that bottom 30%, we can see that Bing sees only 0.95% of the exact search terms within for tail queries that Google sees. If we do the reverse, we look at what, uh, uh, what Google can see of Bing's tail queries, we can see that over 30% of the exact terms that Bing sees, Google is able to see. So using this metric, we can see that Google, in some ways, has a greater than 30 times uh, data advantage compared to Bing. Uh, and obviously, we be concerned to the degree that this is uh, related to the quality of search and we think about how much Bing is able to compete. And this is obviously a very useful input for us thinking about what might be remedies within this uh, particular market. It wasn't the only thing that we did as well. We also uh, looked at tracking and privacy enhancing technologies, which are crucially important and really building up uh, technical understanding for the organization. And we looked at choice architecture and privacy uh, and how these things were presented and trying to analytically look at whether there were any issues with the consumers. And we found several. As we moved from the digital advertising market study, uh, we uh, discovered as an organization how uh, Google was going to be, uh, had said they were going to remove third party cookies and uh, introduce a whole series of new technologies under the term privacy sandbox in order to continue to allow uh, targeting advertising and a variety of other services. So we launched an antitrust case, uh, I believe it was January last year, and uh, we uh, have agreed a number of, so technically the case has finished, we've agreed a number of commitments with Google for how they're going to introduce this new technology that uh, deals with the concerns that Google, see, Google might self-reference uh, through these changes. But it turns out that the technologies that are being proposed, uh, and, and we're now working very closely with, uh, uh, with Google, as the, uh, and will continue to, as they um, introduce these new technologies. But these technologies are fundamentally quite complicated. So for example, in order to do targeting, there's two sets of uh, technologies, both of which use machine learning in order to uh, in order to make sure they can target whilst there's uh, whilst it's still privacy uh, preserving. We also need to be able to um, uh, advertisers need to understand the return on their advertising. They need to be able to improve their advertising. So they need to get feedback on that advertising. Um, of course, a concern is if they got feedback, would that actually identify individuals? So there's a series of new technologies that allow for measurement and attribution um, whilst being privacy preserving. But lastly, there's a whole bunch of ways that firms, if they wanted to continue to track you, they could fingerprint you and continue to track you through the internet. So there's a whole series of additional technologies to prevent this fingerprinting, um, while still allowing a whole variety of things like uh, dealing with fraud that you'd want to have happen. And these are fundamentally really quite technical issues, but actually incredibly important if we're going to try and evaluate uh, 
um, the potential for Google self-referencing that we get under these technological issues. So we've got three members of my team that are uh, embedded within that case. And the fact that they're able to work on that case has really made sure that the case can run forward much more quickly, but also more rigorously as well. So for a relatively small amount of resource from my team, we can have a really large impact. Now, um, a mobile ecosystems market study was uh, published uh, just last week. Uh, within that, we've already heard discussion about um, you know, valid or not valid arguments for um, the limits on platforms that might come from security. And that was one of our roles on the study, was to try and, um, working with external experts, try to make sure that the study team could really understand um, what were and what uh, were not um, valid arguments. Um, and we also, again, were dealing with quite a large amount of data. We had data on, um, for each individual app, data on a variety of different types of billings that the different firms had. And then we also had a lot of information on um, app discovery, so how people got to their apps as well, so we could really understand the nature uh, of these markets. Uh, the behavioral scientists, uh, we were able to step up a notch. So this is an example, it's actually an old example, uh, of what you need to do with on Android in order to cancel a subscription. And uh, you, know, you, you might be able to see the details, or, or might not, but it, it's seven clicks and it's really not obvious. Um, this is just one example of many where it's really important to get into uh, and analyze how choices are being uh, presented to consumers. Um, the Meta Giphy merger. So this was another example where we deployed a really relatively small amount of resource. So one of our dead scientists who had a background in the technology industry. Uh, and there was a particular theory of harm uh, that was focused on what Facebook would be able to do if it had access to Giphy's data. And this data scientist, with a lot of experience, was able to get into the technicalities, the, um, the software development kit, the APIs, uh, the various different types of data, and provide really good technical analysis that helped the team whilst being a very actually efficient use of his time. So again, we had really good impact with a small amount of resource. Um, this is an example of us helping with specific data or technology focused theories of harm. But we can also help in mergers when there's understanding tech markets more generally or products. So a good example would be cloud with the, the merger of Google and Looker, uh, the merger of Salesforce and Tableau. We were really able to help the study team uh, understand the nature of cloud markets. Um, we also help with intellectual property remedies as well. So in the Toby Smartbox case, these were um, providers of um, software for people with disabilities. Uh, one of the potential remedies was open sourcing the code, I believe from Toby, if I've got that right. And we, were, uh, we uh, evaluated whether we thought that was a, a reasonable um, proposal or not. Um, so case is just one thing that we do. Uh, we're also really focused on building technology, and we're going to hear more from this from my uh, colleague, uh, the Director of Data Science Engineering and eDiscovery, David Dole, tomorrow. Um, so I'll, I'll keep this brief. But the evidence submission portal was uh, a very important piece of... Uh, it's actually both a data pipeline and a tool that we built. So um, we regularly have to take in, uh, take in many, many documents, uh, especially for our mergers. Um, this uh, increased uh, after Brexit, where we were having to act um, in much larger cases, and we were anticipating having to move up from maybe one to 200,000 documents to potentially having many millions. In fact, in the uh, NVIDIA ARM case, we had seven million documents we were dealing with. So we needed to be able to get these documents in much larger scale, uh, but also be able to check they're in the right format, reject them if they're not, do a whole bunch of processing, have it ready to be um, put onto our... Um, uh, the platform, the off-the-shelf platform that we use, Nuix. So this is what the evidence submission portal does. But moreover, because we've actually built the data pipeline ourselves, we can actually start building in our own data science capability as well, our, our own specific bespoke, and this is a, a, an example of one of these, this diagram is an example of one of these, our own bespoke machine learning for specific for competition cases uh, into the data pipeline to give new capabilities for our, uh, for our teams. Um, on developing techniques, uh, a big focus for us has been algorithms. Um, we, uh, and it goes a little bit beyond developing techniques, we really wanted to actually balance the conversation as well, because we, there was a, a very large focus on the potential of collusion, 
uh, price collusion, but we, th we thought there were many other forms of uh, concerns with algorithms, so we really wanted to make sure that, us as, that we as an organisation could think very carefully around the variety of different cases and then make sure that we're prepared to take forward those cases. So these are a, a variety of different firms uh, you know, providing some excellent services, all of which are using algorithms. Uh, I'm sure that all of us have interacted with algorithms uh, through our phones, uh, you know, probably, possibly even the dozens of times today. So uh, this is what we're trying to do with that particular work was really understand it. We're now getting into much more detail. So we're hoping to publish something um, before the end of the year that comes back to the different theories of harm that we've um, we identified previously and gets into more detail of what does it really mean to take forward cases involving algorithms. Uh, another example that uh, papers that we published two months ago is online choice architecture. Relatively similar aims to the algorithm study is in to try out, lay out the territory of what we need to know about in terms of online choice architecture and think very um, carefully about how we can um, uh, get more um, uh, advanced in terms of using this capability within cases. Um, in addition, uh, We've actually been building up a different set of sort of research type capabilities for horizon scanning and getting deep into understanding technolo technologies that are coming forward. So we've developed a, uh, a four-stage process working closely with our colleagues in the digital markets unit. And once we've identified technologies we need to care about, we start the uh, second stage is actually to uh, go a little bit deeper into those technologies and have a series of different outputs, uh, one of which is these sort of technology primers that get into these technologies. So, uh, I mentioned five different roles earlier. Expert data and technology advice. I gave a series of examples of where we've been advising cases. Data acquisition and data science of various different types. And I've given an example of all of these as well. Uh, tool, tool development. Uh, I mentioned the evidence submission portal, but there's several other examples as well. Um, and again, David will touch on this more tomorrow. Uh, behavioral science, and lastly, as I was just discussing, it's our research horizon scanning capabilities, but also how we're trying to put that into the case pipeline. Some reflections. Um, you know, technologists within the, competition, the context of competition and consumer protection agencies is a new, uh, is very much a new profession. And we, we work very much closely with the lawyers, economists, and actually other disciplines that we have here at the CMA. Um, but actually, there are a variety of different skill sets. Actually, Andrea mentioned this earlier. Data science, data engineering, technology insight, behavioral science. These are uh, people who haven't uh, you know, traditionally thought of themselves as competition professionals, though we're working on trying to change that. Um, it is actually across the... Uh, across the competition cases, not every case that we get involved in is digital, but it, but with the um, at the moment we do find that the majority of our focus is on digital cases, and I think almost all of the examples, if not all of them, were digital. Um, this can radically change how we approach the case. There can be completely new lines of investigation that we might go down. Um, because we have technologists involved. And there can be very, very high returns on investments. So I gave the example of MetaGiphy, Meta gave the example of the Google's privacy sandbox, where we can get a very high return on technologies time. Um, in addition, it's not just about casework. There's a whole bunch of long-term investment that we can make that can really pay off in terms of technology or techniques. Um, and this is a plea to other competition agencies on behalf of your technologists. Uh, please allow them to be involved in their building their platform. There's nothing technologists work that dislike more than a bad technology stack. Uh, the, uh, going forward, uh, what I think we should do and what I would like to see is much more use of granular data. I find I learn so much more when we get on top of granular data, especially if we're able to put that together with careful causal identification techniques as well. Um, in particular, I also think experiments are going to be really important. And this isn't necessarily just for, definitely for remedies, but maybe not only remedi remedies. There's a lot that you can learn from experiments. Uh, doing experiments in my experience, is a very humbling experience because you almost never get what you expected in the first place. Um, I also thought, um, think that we need to see an integration of machine learning and also new data sources into how we build evidence for cases. Uh, and we're, you know, we're just starting on this path. Andrea touched on this as well, I've already mentioned. It's really trying to think about how do we mainstream this and create competition technologists as a profession. So, two potential game changers. So we're, and we've started working on both of these. So the one is 
if we, as we build our monitoring capabilities through scraping, through data pipelines and other capabilities, how much can we as a set of agencies start to proactively identify where there's problems rather than necessarily having to wait for complaints or merger notifications of these kind of things? How can we move to being more proactive uh, as opposed to less reactive? And I think there's real opportunities here. This is building on work actually the sector regulators have been doing for several years now. Uh, so this is, uh, if people don't know this image, this is from Minority Report. Uh, when they're trying to do, uh, it's the uh, Department of Pre-Crime. Uh, the, uh, the second thing which I think is really important is we've already talked about, um, and this has come up a number of times, about collaboration. But from my, my data science and my data engineering teams, the majority of what they do, the outputs they do, the majority of that is represented in code. The marginal cost of copying code is very, very close to zero. To the extent that the different agencies are working on similar problems, and we working up, we are working on similar problems, we can really benefit from this. So this is these are different networks, right? And we can think about these are direct network effects if we can get working together, right? So if I can build a piece of code and my team can use it, fantastic. If I can build a piece of code and six other agencies can use it even better still, and even better for me when they start building code and we can use it. So it's, and it's not just about sharing code, it's about co-developing code. And we need the capability to be able to do that, and I think that could be a real game changer. So final slide is the publication uh, that was already mentioned. Uh, so uh, please take a look. Uh, it builds on what I've just been talking about, and I'd like to now switch over to uh, ask my um, colleagues from the other agencies to join us uh, on the panel. Now, um, whilst we're doing that, I'll uh, mention the, it'd be great to get your questions. Uh, we're going to try to rattle through things fairly quickly if we can, uh, to allow quite a bit of time for questions. If you, if you look on your um, name tag, uh, I think online this will be fairly obvious how to ask questions. For those in the room, if you look at your name tag, you'll see the, uh, on the back side, there's the actual um, website you need to go to, and there's also a QR code that you can scan that will take you there. So please do, uh, please do, do, do that. So I'll uh, introduce my fellow panelists. So um, I'm going to introduce them in the order that they'll be speaking. So first is to Jane. So uh, Jane is the uh, general manager of, uh, if I'm going to use the Australian term, data uh, and intelligence uh, at the ACCC, the Australian agency. Uh, she's been working for... Um, about over 15 years in a variety of enforcement intelligence roles at the ACCC. Uh, her background is law, economics, and political economy. And I'm going to mention this all because we've all got slightly different backgrounds. Uh, next up uh, is Jan. Uh, Jan is the head of the digital economy unit at the Autorité de la Concurrence. Apologies for my pronunciation. Uh, that's the French, uh, French agency. And uh, Jan is an economist by training. Um, the uh, next is Menno uh, Israel. Menno is the chief data officer at the... Um, the, the the Dutch agency, the ACM, uh, and apologies for that one, uh, and has uh, held this role since 2019. Uh, his background is in cognitive science slash uh, artificial intelligence, and he's been running data teams for some time now. Uh, next is Stephanie New uh, Nguyen. Uh, she's the acting chief technologist at the uh, Federal Trade Commission in the US. Uh, so her background is in digital service, public policy, and sort of digital me uh, media theory and design. And next is Flavio Leiner. Uh, he's the, uh, or was the head of the intelligence analysis, thank you, uh, and forensic IT support unit in the in DG Comp in the in the commission until the end of April this year. He's now moved on to state aid. Uh, his background is also economics, uh, and he'll he'll be talking about that unit. Uh, and last and by no means least is Leila Wright. She's the associate deputy commissioner uh, of the digital enforcement and intelligence branch at the Competition Bureau, uh, and you've had a variety of uh, variety of positions at the Competition Bureau, and your background is actually law, I think, if that's correct. So um, what we're going to do for the panel, we're going to have four minutes for each panellist to talk a bit about their agencies and answer the topic question for this panel, uh, and then we're going to have a few questions from me, and then hopefully quite a few questions from you. So without any further ado, <coughs> over to you, Jane. Thanks, Stefan, and thanks to you and the CMA team for the opportunity to be here today, and particularly to um, escape the Australian winter to this beautiful sunshine in London. Um, I'll just quickly recap on our structure. Um, uh, Gina gave an outline earlier, but for those who weren't um, present for that panel. Um, nearly 12 months ago now, the ACCC established uh, its data and intelligence branch, which I head up, 
And that brought together four existing units um, within the agency. Our contact centre, which we call our info centre, and that collects data from, um, it's actually almost, or it, more than 400,000 contacts to the agency each year now um, from the general public. Our intelligence analysts are also in the branch along with our legal technologists who specialise in e-discovery and digital forensics, as well as our strategic data analysis unit or SDAU, um, which is made up of a range of data analysts with, with varied backgrounds including st um, statistics, maths, computer science, we've even got an astronomist in the team, um, and data scientists. Um, our branch provides support for teams across the agency um, and is based in our uh, sort of centralised um, uh, advice division alongside our lawyers and economists. Um, I'll just make three observations about the ways in which we're using these skills at the ACCC. Um, firstly, given the prevalence of digital platforms and the potential for them to impact um, in a harmful way on consumers and competition, uh, like many other regulators, the ACCC has established a permanent digital platforms branch um, whose staff have become experts in the products and services of the digital uh, platforms. Um, and that's obviously an established model for competition and consumer regulators for their investigators and their inquiry staff to temporarily become experts in a whole range of different markets simply by spending a lot of time um, interrogating them, speaking to the various stakeholders and engaging in a variety of methods to collect information about them. Um, something we've learned in relation to digital platforms in particular though, um, but increasingly across the economy, is that it's very effective to complement those team members with technical experts whose data analysis um, and data science qualifications and training can assist us to even better interrogate and understand the platforms, their products and services. Um, for example, by unpicking algorithms, by helping us to acquire and analyse large volumes of data, including through web scape, scraping and then the application of, of AI and machine learning um, models uh, or techniques. Uh, and our data scientists and statisticians, importantly, also have the requisite understanding of the potential risks around using such techniques. Um, and I think that's really crucial to ensure that we're collecting and using that um, information in the most robust and defensible manner. The second observation I'll make is that, um, and, and this touches on what Stefan was saying as well, while our analysts, data scientists and technologists um, tend to spend a large amount of their time on tactical work, that is, contributing to particular cases or projects, more and more they're making a significant contribution to the way the agency actually functions, as well as its operational and strategic direction. So, um, for example, our, our SDAU, our data analysis unit, is leading the development of our agency data strategy um, that sets out the, the work that we're doing to uplift our data capabilities across the full co cohort of our teams, including through improved data fluency, better data management, testing and scaling new advanced analytics capabilities and machine learning, as well as working in partnership with our IT department to invest in the right projects and technology to support this as part of our agency's digital transformation project program. Um, we're also improving the agency's operational decision making, um, for example, by doing things like building resourcing dashboards that help the agency track where its uh, employees are spending their time, and that in turn can contribute to decisions about selection and prioritisation of work. Uh, and we've been doing things uh, also to draw d together data from a range of sources um, to prepare intelligence reports and horizon scans that assist in setting our annual compliance and enforcement priorities. Um, it is, I will note, a challenge, and I know that my fellow panellists also experience this, in trying to balance that tactical work um, with that sort of future-looking work and, and capability building, particularly in an agency where your enforcement work is really the flagship um, piece of work that you do. Uh, and just lastly, I'll say that by bringing together our data specialists, our um, intelligence analysts and our legal technologists, um, and putting them with the team that collects our most valuable data, uh, we've been able to find commonalities among these previously separate teams and combine their skill sets to solve different types of problems for the agency and to build new capabilities as well. So things like applying natural language pro processing um, to uh, categorise the contacts that we're receiving through our info centre, which in time will assist us to do things like use chatbots to help consumers. Um, building dashboards, again, for our info centre to help them with their reporting 
and, and, and um, working with our legal technologists and um, data analysts to use new techniques to identify near duplicate documents, uh, again, using natural language processing. Thanks. Great, thanks, Jane. Over to you, Jan. Oh, thank you, Stephen. So I'm Jan Gutmann, head of the Digital Economy Unit from the Autorité de la Concurrence, the French Competition Authority. Um, the unit was created in September 2020 uh, based on the acknowledgement by the authority that it needed to strengthen its capabilities regarding digital matters. Uh, we have mainly four objectives. The first one is to develop new uh, digital tools to help uh, the case handler works. Uh, for example, we built a screening tool that we'll talk more in details on Friday. But also, uh, simple tools can have, can have a large impact. For example, we publish an interactive map on the website of the authority uh, that uh, pinpoint all the firms fined by the authority between uh, 29 and 2020. And so we had a lot of complaints from lawyers <laughs> regarding this map. <laughs> so it was very effective. <laughs> Um, second objective is to help a case team regarding uh, cases, mainly involving digital matters. And one data scientist uh, can uh, help very much uh, regarding specific uh, to illustrate with two quick examples uh, regarding the ATT framework that was already mentioned uh, today. Uh, the, there was a complaint lodged at the authority with interim measures. And within six months, uh, two case handlers assisted by a data scientists were able to release an interim decision. So it's very quick for competition authority. And the case is still going on on the merits. And another case is the Google News Corp, where Google entered in a transaction uh, with the authority and was fined uh, 200 million uh, euros regarding um, kind of self-referencing in the ad tech sector. And in these very specific cases, the authority had to analyze more than uh, four terabytes of data. So uh, for your standard, Stephen, it's about two months of queries from <laughs> Google and Bing in the UK. And it represented more than 200 million of results from actual bits. And so you can see that the help, like Stephen said, of uh, data scientists can accelerate uh, the work of traditional case handlers. We have also two more missions. Uh, the other one is to collaborate with other data scientists in France, but also abroad. And so you could say that being here is part of my missions. <laughs> I'm very uh, happy to be here. And we've been in touch with a lot of other data units from among authorities. And the last one, is to collaborate uh, with the academic world. We have currently two research projects. One is the DataCross2 uh, pan-European project that aims to detect collusions among uh, public procurement uh, using publicly available databases. And so we are among um, uh, 17, I think, agencies, but not only competition authority, but also anti-corruption and so on. And the last one, it's a research project uh, in collaboration with the Codex 10.4 project. And we aim to publish an article at uh, the end of the year, so stay tuned, we hope mm -hmm. to publish. And so to conclude, I will say that during these almost two years, we've been very busy, but also very effective, like said Bill. <laughs> and I think that we help the authority as a world to be more effective. Lovely, thanks, Jan, and over to you, Menno. Okay, thank you, Stefan. Uh, so, my name is Menno Israel. I'm a Chief Data Officer at the Authority for Consumer and Markets in the Netherlands. Um, um, data and the ACM. Uh, first, a little bit of thing about the ACM. So we are uh, uh, we have a competition department uh, and a consumer protection uh, department, but also uh, one department is the energy market regulator, uh, the post telecom transport uh, regulator. So we have um, a lot of uh, variety in data sets and in required uh, analysis and in products uh, uh, we deliver and. Um, 
we started uh, in 2020 with, uh, with the data hub, so that's the, where all the data scientists and data engineers are located. And we started with about 10 data scientists and data engineers, and now uh, we're at about uh, 20, and also uh, expanding the capabilities and also our functions to more data management, data governance, which is also part of, uh, of our role. Um, what we do, what kind of things do we do? Well, uh, first of all, we divided the capacity that the data hub has, like 20 FTE, uh, uh, through the middle. So 50% of our work uh, is on casework for the different departments. And the other 50% is for yeah, a lot of other things, uh, further uh, capability building, but also for the more ACM broad projects. So the, the, the first 50% is really for different uh, specific departments uh, and casework in, in, in the departments. And um, so the other 50% is uh, projects that uh, uh, benefit all of uh, the departments. And that's one of the things that uh, was quite new because you had these different departments with their own role, their own re responsibility. And through... Uh, yeah, mixing data or mixing uh, uh, products or uh, uh, building products for, for one department and then change it a little bit so the other departments can use it, you get a, a much more coherent uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, a, a coherency. Um, so uh, ACM broad projects, uh, but also innovation and uh, capability, uh, capability building. Some examples of the projects we run in the different departments are, uh, for example, data analysis on mergers, uh, using a geographical uh, analysis, for example, uh, detecting, park uh, the, the, uh, detecting dark patterns uh, on commercial websites for our uh, consumer department and also collecting and analyzing uh, customer complaints from the internet to get an idea which companies are uh, doing the, the wrong things. Uh, anonymy uh, uh, detection on tra transactions on uh, the Dutch energy trading market, so that's for our uh, energy uh, regulator, and also for the behavioral part, oh. um, uh, finding a, p a psycholo psychological, no, uh, behavioral uh, constructs related to compliance and non-compliance for uh, uh, companies in corporate docu uh, documents. So we use a lot of uh, NLP for that. Then I have uh, yeah. Re recruitment and retaining. So I will do this very uh, fast. Uh, so we have, uh, of course, it's a difficult market for uh, finding the right data scientists and finding data scientists. We have one track, which is the normal ACM uh, way of uh, acquiring uh, uh, people for recruiting, but we also have founded the data traineeship. Uh, we do it now for four years with two other agencies, the uh, uh, Healthcare Authority and the Financial Market Authority. We normally also cooperate with them and we started so our own data traineeship. And that works quite well, so six people are hired every two years and then they shift every eight months and at the end they choose a, uh, uh, an agency. Brilliant. Thanks, uh, thanks, Benno. And over to you, Stephanie. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, CMA, Stefan. I'm humbled to be here with all of you. Uh, just a little bit of context on the United States. Uh, back in the 2010s, during the Obama era, we saw a boom of the civic tech wave. Uh, this meant digital service technologies, technologists embedded into agencies, building and designing products and services for <laughs> millions of people. Uh, a hat tip to uh, the UK's government digital service, which we really drew inspiration from. Uh, I spent uh, many years working and uh, being with hundreds of low-income families who went broke because of predatory fees with student loan servicing. I've seen small businesses, many who are immigrant families, including my own, who struggled during a global pandemic uh, because of restaurant fees and food delivery apps where pricing was really obscure. Um, and fast forward to today, there are a growing number of these uh, government digital services across government. Um, but the question here is, instead of technologists building and designing products and services in government, 
how do we have technologists who are embedded into regulatory agencies building and designing policies, working on casework, working on investigations? How do we ensure that these technologists and the regulatory agencies are connected to the communities, to the individuals, to the voices of people who we all are working toward? So this is kind of the focus of why I'm here and why our team is here at the agency. Um, the strategy on a high level um, is to really focus on developing different tactics to, to focus on root causes of harm instead of whack-a-mole type harms that, that come up. Um, secondly, because the FTC has authorities across consumer protection, competition, and privacy, we need to think about uh, a lot of these laws holistically instead of in separate silos. So that's something that's important for our team. In addition, um, this was mentioned earlier, but we are creating remedies of, uh, and a toolkit for our case uh, teams and attorneys uh, that aren't one-size-fits-all solutions. So some of you may have heard um, our work with uh, algorithmic, algorithmic disgorgement, uh, which was on our Ever Album case. And this is something where we need to actually have uh, proportional remedies that attack the, uh, the same level of harms um, that is in the conduct of the case. And finally, trying to craft CID questions, which are more in our uh, requ requests for information, to ensure that we have the level of technical sophistication um, incorporated in the questions that we are really interrogating um, our, our companies. So today, our team focuses on three different areas. First and foremost, like many of my colleagues, uh, working on cases and investigations. This includes uh, developing in investigational techniques. This includes participating in investigational hearings. Um, second is engaging in research and studies that strengthen uh, our tech strategy. So this includes, again, our remedies and toolkits. Horizon scanning, of course, is, is really important to us, especially with a lot of the different emerging harms um, and verticals that, that many of you have already mentioned. Uh, and finally, serving as an expert resource um, in the agency when things come up. So this includes working with Congress on technical assistance. This includes um, collaborating and engaging with our international counterparts, all of you. Um, so where we are now, you've heard a little bit about this from Chair Khan uh, at our agency this morning, but we have increased the number of technologists uh, on staff at our agency, and this includes AI researchers, uh, user experience designers, software engineers, all types of technologists, and we, we plan to keep building up this team. Um, we hope to see a future of uh, Team CTO where we actually build more institutional grounding in our agency. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful for all of the knowledge sharing from our existing technologists in OTEC and our technology enforcement division, uh, and to the inspiration that I draw from uh, the ACCC, CMA, ICO, and um, everyone here today, uh, who have really laid the groundwork for a lot of this work. Lovely. Thanks, Stephanie. And over to you, Flavia. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you, Stefan, for the invitation. I think I was lucky that the invitation came a couple of weeks before I changed job. <laughs> so here I am. I would like to take this topic um, from a, an organizational point of view. Uh, this intelligence analysis and forensic IT support was born in September 16 as a cartel unit. And it has a business objective. Not you, You've heard from Stefan there are models of technology-driven digital transformations. There are also models of business-driven um, digital transformation. And we followed that. The objective was to enhance ex officio detection and prosecution of cartels. So the, the objective was, was clearly a business one. And to address this need, of course, the unit was equipped with tasks that are now consolidated in the new name, intelligence analysis and, and forensic IT support. Uh, one of these tasks is, is analysis, of course, and stem from the fact that we observed that companies were using technology not only to, to do cartels, but to hide them better. So uh, it was clear that to fight at, at the same level, we needed to equip ourselves with the same technological abilities. But, and here comes the organizational aspect, 
uh, we don't have individuals in the unit as service provider to operational units. It's the unit that it has with all these different skills and, and professional uh, figures um, produces a consolidated product on a certain topic. And this is why we have recruited specialized police forces in financial, economic financial uh, matters, intelligence analysts to find and, and analyze unknown information. Because one thing is to analyze a data set that is in your possession. Of course, you may not know what is inside, but you have it, it's known. One thing is to find unknown information to build up a, a cartel case, for instance. So uh, we have put these people into a single unit because we thought that a multidisciplinary element would be a winning move, in the sense that everybody coming with different backgrounds, different experience, would work on the same project with the intelligence analyst, the data analyst, the, the police officer, etc. And they would bring, of course, their, their skills, and they would learn from the others. Because if you think about it, when you have a line of code that may trigger anti-competitive responses, the, the, the code writer may not understand that it is anti-competitive, and the traditional enforcers may not understand this line of code. So you need to build, you build a group, an osmosis, I would say, in which um, all these people will, will learn from each other. And that has allowed us to develop open source intelligence uh, capabilities, uh, exploiting, of course, big data sets to find patterns, auditing algorithms and, and the complex IT structures of company to understand, for instance, uh, how they can uh, violate competition uh, rules. So I think the model is, I, I often use this, this analogy in, in, competition, in, in competition conferences, the model is a little bit of a car navigator. So the car navigator can be extremely sophisticated, can give you a lot of information, but at the end of the day, it's the driver who decides where to go, where the investigation is, is focusing, what is the result that the team, investigative team wants to achieve. And sometimes, when, and I look at the time, and sometimes when you know the area in which you are driving, it's better not to use the navigator. When you don't know in which waters you are, you are swimming, of course, it's better to, uh, know, to, to, to use the navigator. I would like to, from a managerial point of view, I would like to insist on, on a certain skepticism. And contrary to Stefan, we have debates on this. It's, it's usual. Uh, as a manager, you have to understand what the machine will do better and what, what task an investigator will do better. So I think, uh, the, from a managerial point of view, this is one of the, the, the most difficult tasks because clearly uh, an investigator will uh, will know what the causality is, but the machine will maybe only see a correlation. So to make the move from one to the other, you, you need also the human element. Um, there are tasks that are repetitive and abundant. Investigation may have a lot of data, but may not be repetitive. So maybe in certain investigation, the technology is very useful, in others it is not. Uh, one field, and I will finish there, one field in which I see very promising result is certainly bid rigging detection. Because normally you have tender data in certain competition authorities, you have direct access, in other you have to ask them by law. Uh, or you, have to need, you need a law that authorizes the competition authority to, to get access to this. But uh, you can make analysis on hundreds and thousands of products or sectors and markets. And so here probably the future is moving away from screens to try to modelize the bid rigging uh, conduct, like uh, bid suppression, big rotation, and, and all these things. And I think I will stop there because my, no really. my Thanks. time. Thanks, Flavia. And over to you later. Thanks so much, Stefan, and thank you so much to you and your team for having us here today and for this excellent conference that you've all organized. Um, so I'll keep my remarks relatively short uh, to give you a bit of context on the Canadian Competition Bureau's uh, new digital enforcement and intelligence branch. 
uh, about a year ago, the Competition Bureau received some additional funding from the federal government, uh, and we decided as part of that new funding to establish a new branch at the Competition Bureau. Uh, so that new branch was established about eight months ago. Uh, until about six months ago, it was a team of one, being myself. Uh, and so uh, we got some new team members, <laughs> thankfully, about six months ago, and uh, hired our first data scientist about three months ago. Uh, so, uh, you know, we are very much at the beginning of our journey in this area. Uh, but something that I think that we all have on, in common on this stage is that we're all working towards finding ways to move the needle as quickly as possible within our organization, in part because we want to prove the value and the use of the data analytics work within competition enforcement and promotion, and also because we, we all believe in that value and that uh, without it, um, we're really just going to fall further and further behind. Um, and there's two aspects of the work that I find quite exciting. The first is just the spectrum of work uh, that is possible when you speak about data analytics. Uh, so as Stefan said, my background is in law. I've spent my whole career uh, doing competition law, uh, first as a lawyer and then within the Competition Bureau doing enforcement and promotion work. And when you're doing enforcement work, uh, generally, uh, there, there's lots of different ways to bring a case. It generally takes a lot of time and a lot of resources, however you do it. Um, and the difference that I find with this work, which I find very exciting, is that you can do work that takes an afternoon, that really moves the needle for the organization. So if you're able to automate something uh, within the course of three hours, uh, you have saved the organization a significant amount of work, um, a significant amount of people hours. And then at the same time, there are a number of uh, projects that are possible that take many more uh, hours, many more months. Uh, so for example, the Canadian Competition Bureau this week will be launching what we call the collusion risk assessment tool. This is a tool that can be used by procurement agents to identify the risk of bid rigging uh, in their procurement uh, processes and then also um, to provide them with information on how to reduce that risk. Uh, so this is a tool that's been developed by our data analytics team um, that has taken many months to do. And I find that real spectrum to be something quite exciting. Um, the, the second area that I'll speak about is international cooperation. Again, my experience in enforcement and promotion is that we certainly find lots of ways to uh, engage internationally with our counterparts, but there are limits to that uh, engagement, and the limits often have to do with differences in our laws, differences in our market structures. Uh, you, you don't see those types of limitations with this type of work. So Stefan spoke about uh, the possibilities when it comes to code sharing. Um, there's also a lot of uh, discussions that we have just about establishing these types of new branches within competition authorities, how to identify quick wins for competition authorities, how to establish the IT infrastructure, and, and it, it's quite amazing um, that the challenges that I face um, are, are very similar to the challenges that others uh, on this stage face. And, and it's great to have those opportunities to speak through those challenges and find solutions together. Um, so I know that we're tight on time. I'll, I'll end there, uh, but, but very excited to continue the fostering the collaboration between all of our agencies. Brilliant. Thanks, Leila. So, um, I, I can see we've, we, we're going to finish on time at six. So uh, what I'm going to, I've got a few questions for you all. Uh, we're going to actually try and go through that even more quickly if we try to keep to a minute or so as the answers, because we've actually had a few questions coming online, and I certainly actually have got some, uh, some thoughts myself. Uh, I'll have one reflection before we go on that. So you talked about sometimes, sometimes when uh, data scientists can do a, a tiny piece of work, which is incredibly quick. We were looking at one particular case where they were, it was kind of, it was a pre-case. We hadn't were determining whether to take a case forward or not. And the team really wanted a piece of pricing data. Um, it was going to take them, they figured out, it was approximately three weeks to try and 
take the data, it was a bunch of PDF sheets, and turn it into the data they needed. So one of my uh, data scientists looked, he looked into the source code, he saw that there'd been a download button that had been disabled in the source code, flipped it around in about five minutes, had three weeks of data. Uh, the, okay, so uh, the first question, um, and I'm gonna uh, start, with, uh, start with you, Stephanie, is, so how have you been working on integrating technologists into the agency? I think it's three big things. Um, first is trust and regular touch points with our bureau directors of competition and consumer protection. Um, the second is some strong triage system um, to ensure that we are looking at and working on uh, priority casework. Um, and third is just being responsive. There are things that come up that we can't anticipate, and it's important that we really focus on um, building credibility and being able to chime in on cases that might have a technological component, but may not be from a tech company proper. Um, and so, you know, I'll give a shout out to my colleague who is here, Alex Gaynor, if you could raise your hand. Uh, he is someone who will uh, be called on all the time in our agency for any question related to security. And I welcome all of you to ask him questions about security <laughs> if you have them too. Brilliant, thank you, Stephanie. I, I'm going to have to try reducing the amount of time I've given people uh, in advance because that, that that was great. Uh, the uh, so yeah, and same question to you. How are you working on integrating technologists into your agency? Yeah, so as the uh, authority, we have a process of initial formation, but all the new hires go through, and so it's a great way for a new hire, especially data scientists, to learn about competition field and also to meet new colleagues. And another way to do a lot of team buildings is down raid. It's very, very effective, you know? <laughs> <laughs> One data scientist with 10 uh, other fellow colleagues in a hostile environment for 24 hours. It does wonder. <laughs> 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 and I kid you not, it works really well. So you should push your data scientist to do other um, activities like a normal case handler. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. So um, on, on, on a slightly different tack, just trying to think about how um, technologists can start working with other professions. Um, how, how, how do technologists, or you know, more specifically data scientists, how can they best collaborate with case teams and what recommendations do you have for other agencies who might be building similar, uh, similar kind of capability? So over to you, Jane. Thanks. Uh, so it, the answer is it depends a bit on the project. So um, sometimes we'll have somebody embedded in a project or a case team and other times we'll act in more of a consultant role. The key though is um, to involve the technologists and data scientists early and that is a real challenge actually. Um, sometimes they're a bit of an afterthought. So um, my, my main recommendation is to set up systems and uh, to support and encourage case teams to get in touch with the data scientists, the intel analysts, legal technologists as early as possible. Create uh, as little friction in doing that as you possibly can. Create a variety of ways to contact um, your case, your teams, including easy and visible formal request systems. Also making it clear that you welcome informal requests. Um, building and maintaining relationships, of course, potentially thinking about having relationship managers to deal with the different teams across the agency. Um, proactively contacting teams where, where we can potentially add value, so going through board and committee papers to look for work that sounds like it could do with a bit of help uh, in this regard. Um, being visible, we have a communication strategy in our branch which has a range of activities that are designed to try and engage teams um, and, and, and help them to understand what we do and how we can help them. Um, but it's also equally important for our teams, and this follows from what Jan was saying, to understand the context of the rest of the agency, to understand what they're doing, what's important to them, what work is going to provide them with the most value and, and what do, um, you know, outputs or products can you give them that will, will be immediately helpful to them. Um, and, and in that regard, going on a search warrant would be fantastic. I think sitting next, just sitting next to them in the office and listening to what they're, they're doing and talking to them is also a really important um, piece of advice. Brilliant, thanks. So, uh, Menno, can Menno, you... I totally agree with uh, <laughs> all the three of you. What, how we do, did this was um, having at first, the uh, first two years, the data science, they still are, officially they are in the different departments, which creates a kind of ownership for that department uh, uh, and, and a good and strong connection. And from that connection, each department build, build up a, a team of data savvy people, including a data manager, a project coordinator uh, concerning data. 
And now we are more centralizing and using these mini hubs in the different departments to connect to. We are basically part of that. And that gives us the opportunity to, to see all the relevant uh, projects. Lovely, thank you. So uh, over to you uh, next later. Uh, so what do the next five years look like for digital investigations and what are you going to be your priorities? Uh, so uh, we're living exciting times at the Canadian Competition Bureau right now. Um, there was a package of amendments that were uh, put forward in Parliament uh, and uh, our minister has announced that he's interested in doing some broader consultations on amendments to the Competition Act. Uh, I always say that, you know, you could have the most amazing legislation in the world, but if you don't have an organization that's set up to succeed under that new legislation, um, you may not get the results that you're looking for. And so our priority over the next little while is really going to be uh, supporting the organization as we move forward in the digital economy, finding ways to find harm as quickly as possible um, and remedy that harm in new and innovative ways. So, Flavio, what are your uh, what are your priorities, and how are you going to move forward? Well, on? you understand that I cannot commit my family. <laughs> <laughs> Please so do. I will share with you my my vision of what may happen or will happen in the future. Uh, I think I'm going to say two very obvious things. One is that data will increase, and the second that the technology will continue to evolve. But this uh, <laughs> is obvious, but it has repercussions on our, on our work. And, and one, uh, one repercussion is, of course, that all competition authorities will need to keep up with this, uh, this change. And this will require, probably, uh, requiring even, uh, rec recruiting even more specialists with, the, with a level of granularity smaller and smaller. So that someone with something, someone with something, and then putting, putting all these people together. So for, for, from an organizational point of view, and I think Laila in, insisted several times on it, and I agree with that, we will have to combine not only the mastery of the technology, the ability to recruit people, but also operate in a legal framework in which our powers are, exist. So maybe at some point the powers will have to be changed. And, and, and the equilibrium will always be between powers, technology, and skills. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. So uh, we've got a few questions. Uh, I'm also going to put the panel on notice that uh, I'm going to be asking for volunteers if they want to talk about any failures and what they've learned from failures. And I, I'm certainly prepared to talk about one uh, as well. So they weren't prepped in advance for this. Uh, the, um, so there's a lot we can learn from failure. Uh, but I'm going to ask uh, one of the questions that's come through online first. So, um, and we're going to have to, you'll have to indicate who's interested in answering. So what have been the biggest organizational blockers in getting novel types of analysis into cases, and how do you overcome those organizational blockers? Is there anyone who wants to...? I'll, I'll just make a quick comment, which yeah. is I think that um, as an organization, the ACCC is, is, prides itself on being evidence-based, but at the same time, our commissioners are very instinctive and they have a really good understanding of what's going on in markets because of the, all of the work they do and all of the engagement they have with stakeholders. As a result, it can actually com like sort of ironically be difficult to get them to look at data because they, f they actually have a pretty good feel for things themselves already. So there is a bit of a cultural change there in terms of saying, this is what the data is telling us. We have to listen to the data. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyone else want to fill that question? Yes, I think you have to be very pedagogical because as every innovation triggers skepticism on one side, or enthusiasm, it's magic, it works pushing a button, uh, and a unit of this type has to clearly explain what they can do, and more importantly, what they cannot do. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually run a uh, uh, non-chair thought. Uh, I'll, I'll so in terms of getting more focus into novel types of analysis, that isn't actually something we've done that much of. Um, if you look at sort of what I presented, there wasn't too much that was sort of in some ways radically novel. Um, that was one of the things I think that we think we could do more of. I think we could get more into uh, big data. The way that we have done it, uh, and this has worked pretty well, is working with the economists. So actually, they know our capabilities and they get quite involved in the design. But I think as we move forward, we're going to need technologists to get far more involved in actually uh, the design of the analysis uh, as well. Um, so. Uh, how do you compete in the labor market for technology and data skills? Uh, in particular, how do you deal with the fact that we cannot pay as well as the private sector? 
So I can I can speak a little bit yeah, to that please. because we are right in the depths of trying to uh, hire data scientists, and this was a challenge that we knew going in would be something that we need to figure out how to handle. Um, and and we certainly can't pay the the salaries of private firms. What I think sells people is the mandate, uh, because competition issues are in the news very frequently, and there are a lot of people out there like us uh, who just really want to work on this interesting work and um, do things for consumers uh, that, that you're not able to do in private firms. Here, yeah, I can agree. Like, uh, I've been. I knew that's what I was selling, but I was surprised how much people were willing to uh, to buy it. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 <laughs> uh, uh, anyone else would like to uh, tackle that question? Or should yes, we get go for you? If I may add one other point we can sell is diversity, because usually when you're a data scientist in a um, private firm, you usually, usually have only one, maybe two, if you're lucky, data sets that you need to optimize. And when you're working for a competition authority, you have all the sectors available, all the data sets, and so it can be very appealing for people who want are uh, also attracted by the public services. Mm. Um, so, uh, actually quite a good question that was on my uh, iPad for some reason has disappeared, but I'm going to try to... So, the, um, so th there's a, uh, 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 there is absolutely an asymmetry between us and the big, uh, big digital platforms, of course there's going to be. Um, how, do we, uh, how do we bridge that gap? An information asymmetry, you said? Or te yeah, it's particularly technological as well. So they, they've got such fantastic data, such fan fantastic analytical yeah. capabilities. How do, we, how do we bridge that gap? Well, I, I don't think that uh, we have to be better than them. We have a different angle, a different point of view of what they're doing. If we can, if we know enough about what kind of data sets they have, if we are uh, ourselves know enough about uh, uh, data science, machine learning, and new technologies, and we are with clever people, we can predict a little bit what they are doing. We don't have to compete with them in that sense, I think. I agree. I think, uh, you know, it, for our team, it's really a focus on looking at the actual market incentives in the remedies that we try to craft uh, instead of the more downstream sort of impacts where we need to figure out how are we going to actually monitor all these things when they come up? We will definitely not be able to find uh, and hunt down every dark pattern that appears in apps across the entire economy. And so really focusing on how do we shift incentives and what are those remedies um, for our case teams? Yeah, we can uh, conduct uh, sector inquiries uh, for the future regarding some specific uh, markets. For example, at the French Competition Authority, we're currently conducting a sector query on the cloud computing. And we'll become, I think, at the end of the year, expert in uh, cloud competition. But don't ask me to set up your cloud environment for your organization. <laughs> and what I wanted to say, it's easier to understand something that has already been built but to build it from scratch, you know, yeah. but it's kind of obvious. Yeah, so <laughs> I mean, th there's a lot of advantages we have. So with our, with our powers to request information, with our ability to speak to many, many different players, there's actually a lot of advantages that we have. And as we said, it's actually easier to get talent than you might think for us as well. So it's not to say that we won't be far behind. I'll not say that we won't be behind, but we won't be as far behind as you might think, and that's been my experience. And I actually know many people who work in the tech industry, so I feel like I'm uh, speaking from a point of information. Okay, so this will be the last question. Uh, how do you prepare for enforcement in new technological areas like the metaverse or the, sort of, you know, sort of the, the market leading edges that we're seeing in terms of uh, new capabilities in AI? Uh, so I think first you need to understand it, uh, and that's something that has been difficult uh, for competition agencies before they've had these types of teams in place because it was up to uh, the caseworkers whose expertise is in competition to learn these new areas of technology. Uh, so I think that once you understand it, you're able to have a more uh, informed discussion with the competition experts on how that specific technology may be impacting competition and where to look in those markets to find harm as quickly as possible. 
Thank you. Anyone else? I'll, I'll go. I think um, one thing to look at is just history. You know, at one point, the radio, the automobile, the TV, there have been deceptive ads on all of these different new technologies. What can we use from our existing toolkits and uh, laws to apply to these emerging technologies as we define them, whether it's AR, VR, cloud computing, and other things like that? Brilliant. Um, so does anyone have any pressing things to add? Otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up for the day. So um, this, uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the first day uh, of our conference. In fact, the first day of the uh, CMA data conferences that will be uh, going forward from uh, here on in. Um, I, I certainly know I really enjoyed the event and uh, took a, look, uh, a lot away from it. Um, we're going to um, start tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. London time. So uh, just like to invite uh, those of us in the room and perhaps those back uh, 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 joining us virtually to thank everyone on the panel and thank you very much.